<coughs> everyone, including hello, everyone. everyone. <laughs> we are live today with a special guest. Uh, on my left, starting on my left, we have uh, Stephen Stratvert, composer. Hey, everybody. And our special guest, filmmaker Paul Sampson. Hello. An actor. And uh, after that is Kyle Juhas. Hello, world. Scoring mixer. <laughs> and today, uh, as usual, we're going to talk about scoring. Yes. So, uh, Paul over here, uh, we've worked together several times. Yes, we have. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if I've actually seen you with this new look of yours. What is this all about? Arr. <laughs> I'm just uh, I'm in the middle of filming a pirates movie, ah. a little kids movie, little tiny kids, little tiny kids, little, little tiny kids, little, little little boys and girls, little chiquitos. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I have a strapping beard for another two weeks. I see we have Eve tuning in. He says, "What's up, guys? What's up? Eve, what's up?" <laughs> so uh, yeah, this should be a really interesting show, you know, because we can finally really get proof. From the pudding, you know, of everything we've been talking about, you know, what what matters as a composer for a filmmaker uh, to be, you know, working in movies and film scoring, what uh, what doesn't matter, you know, let's get the let's get the truth from the no source. One, no one ever talks about that. That's right. What doesn't matter? It's always, mm. you know. Well, you know, a lot of people have a lot of information going on out there about what you need to learn, what you don't need to learn. Uh, what colleges you go to? Do you need to go to college? Um, you know, how much is talent worth? Uh, how much is professionalism worth? These are all things that I think having a filmmaker in the studio here today uh, could be really helpful to answer. So, what do you think, Paul? Uh, I, I think experience. Is, yeah, is experience is huge. I mean, predominantly, I'm an actor. I'm a film act, uh, stage actor, but. Um, before I transitioned into film, uh, I was an extra. I did a lot of extra work. And a lot of my theater buddies were like, yeah, doing extra work? Why are you doing extra work? Because, you know, when you're on stage, it's, it's, it's stage right. But stage right translate, translate into uh, camera left. Mm. And just being an extra and being around it and, and, and the ferocity when you're, when you're on stage and the, the outwardness of your performance compared to like, the micro... 50 lens or 70 lens in a close-up in film just being an extra when I was young you, hmm. you kind of pick up little things and I mean do they teach that in, in film school you could take an on-camera class but I think just being out there um, everything makes you better like think you're a composer let's say you're in a rock group it makes you a better composer you know if you're an actor but you become a writer it makes you a better a better actor so I think everything you can Taste and experience helps you grow. I mean, you're a, a great pianist. I mean, you know, I've heard you play piano and other instruments, and it helps you as a composer, Evan. Right. You know, you know so every experience you have. Yeah. So I, I'm not for or against um, academia. That's right terminology. I think you get more experience on the street, so to speak. But you yeah. can learn. Everyone's different. Some actors, they have just raw talent. And they don't need classes, and that. But then, sometimes the classes redirect you. And the same thing with with film school or with music school. Like you know, a, a great talented person that goes to Berkeley will be this, just that much better, right? You know, for music. So I mean, uh, you know, it's everyone has their own path yeah. they take in life. You know, and I think it's the same thing with, with with being an entertainer or an artist or a composer or anything, right? You know, you don't want to be an unguided Missile. genius or an unguided, yeah. you know, talent. Yeah. You want to have some direction there and some hone that, you know. Yeah. There's, uh, what's his uh, name of the uh, genius uh, there, uh, Steve? It's uh, Chris Lange, is that right? He's a 220 IQ. Oh, yeah, my, uh, Chris Langham or Chris, something. Chris Lang, Langham. Lang, he, he's a 220 <laughs> IQ. And, um, you know, the problem with the problem has been that he's still kind of like living with his mom on the farm and... And uh, he's working on these theories about, yeah. you know, <laughs> black holes and all these things. Oh. But, you know, he's unable to kind of click in the world and turn it into any kind of like mega uh, success or, or achievement because uh, he's, you know, st still sort of like back there, uh, not really honing his gifts. It kind of goes half circle to what you began with 
uh, when you first say what matters and what doesn't matter. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you can't relate, yes, you know, like sometimes yes. my IQ is not two twenty, <laughs> probably closer to twenty. But uh, <laughs> on a good day, <laughs> why are you guys laughing? It's not funny. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. Uh, um, but uh, it's like uh, sometimes I feel like I'm writing stuff, and uh, not you have to dummy it down. But sometimes you have to realize you got to get to the audience what they can digest mm-hmm. on the masses sometimes. You know, you pick a moment. Sometimes you do a film or you do something for yourself, and that's called an art piece or a piece of music or whatever. And then sometimes you do it more commercially. And I think um, right. you got to know when to pick your moments. And uh, just I'm working on a movie now, and it's a kid's movie. And uh, I'm, I'm a lot of times you see me in movies. When I show up in a movie, it's not good for anybody. I mean, people just get slaughtered, you know. And I, I walk away like just kind of on the, on the horse, like hey, I killed everyone. Right. <laughs> but this is a kids' movie, so uh, you know I, I'm not. It's you have, you have to you have to play not you never play the audience on stage. They say, but you have to know what movie you're in. And I guess when you're scoring a movie, it's the same thing if you're doing a comedy or a drama or uh, you know you got to know what you're scoring, what what project you're doing. So I think knowing your your arena is probably the most important thing. Mm-hmm. You know, be free, do your thing, but at least that's where you got to know, you know, your limits. Yeah. It's funny, we were just talking about arenas in the previous uh, uh, yeah. podcast. Yes. That's so your, 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 your relationships, your friends, the diet, just everything that's in your arena, you know, it all goes kind of towards, you know, where you're going to go, where you're going to be going in the direction. And how that, like you just mentioned, that very specific <clears throat> acting environment that you're in, that specific role, where you just mentioned, you want to be yourself, but you still have to sort of work in these confines of what you're right. still doing. I mean, you, you can't, know? right, you yeah. gotta, I mean, I, the first day I was working, I delivered a line, I was telling jokes on set, well, everyone's laughing, and the guy said action, and boom, I, I, I turned into, Kill you know, her. I turned into Dracula, basically, you know, <laughs> eventually I got, I got an I, uh, not Dracula. I mean, turned to this like really vicious pirate. Right. My first line, I said, huh. and the uh, the grip came up to me and said, "Dude, he goes, you went from the funniest person in the world to Satan." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I said, "He goes, I was, I was so strong." And I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Wow, that scared the <laughs> out of me." I went, "Oh, I went, oh, I'm in a kids movie." <laughs> so I yelled you know, the director. I said, right. "I said, Rick, can I do one more time?" <laughs> he goes, "Okay." <laughs> and so I did it a lot more light. Kind of softened it up. Oh yeah, like I went mm-hmm. like you know half, mm. and I finished it. And they they said cut, and he went, "That's the one." <laughs> so the rest of the movie, I knew what he was going for. I went and I saw. Uh, I remember this must have been twenty years ago. I went and I saw the prophecy, the Christopher mm-hmm. Walken film. Yeah, you know, yeah. I saw the prophecy in about um, Universal Studios or one of those areas there, one of those theaters. And uh, I'm watching the whole thing, and then all of a sudden, this, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but there's at one point, Satan comes, he sort of has a meeting up on top of this hill, and Satan comes, Hmm. and the character was, I was just like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like it, it was, this actor was incredible, and it was like, uh, being seductive, you know, it wasn't the Satan you think of, you know, and, uh, and then the lights went up, and who was sitting behind me? But it was him. It was Vigo Mortensen. That's who that was at that time. It was Vigo Mortensen. But I was so scared. <laughs> you don't want to push him at all. Like, yeah. and I'm like, oh my god! And he was with his girlfriend or something. He walks out, and I was like, holy, oh. it's Satan. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's remarkable, you know what? Yeah. What you can do when you're a really, really talented actor. Yeah. What you can do to an audience. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I mean, you've seen. I mean, I don't know before. Your. Um, your wife now mm-hmm. when she saw me in the um, the clown thing I did oh gosh I mean I, I was she was feeding me dinner every night and happy to see me and laughing and joking oh Samson's coming by all happy you know Samson's coming by and then Evan made the mistake of showing her something that I had oh, done yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I'm not going to get into it but it, it won the whole the whole world it won the whole world that uh, what I did it was uh, and uh, it was but it was very scary and and yeah. um, and the next time I next time I came to the house, she um, she went upstairs and hid. <laughs> well, I remember for about a week, she didn't come out of the, out of the room, and and she's like, "Where's he get that from? It comes from somewhere." And I was like, "You know, he's an actor. It's 
Let me show it a comedy reel. It's a comedy. <laughs> it's a comedy reel. It's a comedy. <laughs> comedy reel. Yeah, if you haven't seen uh, like uh, some of the things that Paul's have been in, just go take a look on uh, YouTube for Paul Sampson reel, perhaps, you know, and you might come across that scene. That it's, it's going to blow you away. Yeah, some things are fun and then some things aren't. Yeah, that's not, yeah, that's uh, unbelievable. <laughs> I think that's really, I mean, you have such an incredible, you know, resume. Paul, if I could just fanboy for a second. Oh, I mean, you do. Honestly, just because you, you do so many different roles. And usually have a lot of actors who get typecast, and it's a certain personality. Yeah. He's, the, he's the funny guy. He's the serious guy. He's, you know, he's the mm. Christopher Walken type. You know? <laughs> so it's, I, I do, I think that's one of those things where, do you think that comes more from just that kind of that raw talent? Or do you think it's more just experience over well, time that you kind of develop those thanks. characters? Yeah. I'll give it, to get 20, Absolutely. 20 bucks I can borrow. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. It's 20 bucks, thank you. Um, I think, uh, I mean, okay, the last four things I've done, uh, I played a Serbian in the, in the John claude Van Damme movie. I played a leader of the gang, I, I, and I speak Serbian in the movie. And I took the role because it's John claude Van Damme, yeah. and I'm the leader of the gang, so I was like, yeah, I, I get to speak Serbian. So I took the role for a lot of reasons. But not because you speak Serbian. I, no, I learned it phonetically. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, we used... Maybe half of it, and the other half, the guy I was working with, didn't come prepared. So you know how in movies, like it, like Red October, yeah, they begin speaking Russian, and then they yeah. segue to English for yeah. a movie. Right, right. right. So we, I was doing the whole thing in Serbian. <laughs> I was ready to do the whole movie in Serbian, but the guy uh, I was working with, not not JC, mm-hmm. but the, one of the guys in my crew, mm-hmm. he couldn't do it. Oh, he did like. Two words. Oh, I see. And so I just babbled for a while, and then I went back to it on my own. But uh, but I took that role because it was different. Then I just played a, a sergeant in a movie about a PTSD. Oh, okay. And it's a very, very heavy movie. There's mm. a, a couple of guys kill themselves in the movie. Mm. You know, it's about, it's a real, it's a topic that's ignored. Yes. But um, it should it's be. important. It's important. And I did that really heavy role, and then this one came up, and it's a pirate in a kid's movie. So I, <laughs> I try to take things... That are totally different, right? And mm-hmm. I know Evan. I know your scores when I, when Evan Dracula, first lured me in <laughs> to composing my movie. He gave me the kitchen sink, and I'm like, "Well, who composed this? Because it's a light comedy." He goes, "I did." I said, "Who composed this?" He goes, "It's a thrill." He goes, "I did too." <laughs> I go, "Wait a minute, hmm. I, I like this guy. <laughs> He's in a lot of range." And my I movie did. Night of the Templar, you know, it's a dark comedy. It's a, it's a. It's a sometimes a slasher. It's a period piece. It's um it's a murder mystery of yes. who done it. Yeah, it's everything but a musical. Actually, I do play guitar and sing in the director's yeah, cut. So, and I needed someone that could do all different genres, and that's why I went with Evan. Give me the twenty bucks back. All right. <laughs> uh, I went with Evan and his his crew because uh, it was, uh, you know, it's like life. You know, you wake up in the morning. And and you laugh and you sing and you dance and you cry. It's like life, right. my movie. And, wow. and and you have to have that as far as being an actor or a talent or a musician or a, a composer. You never mm-hmm. know what's going to come to you. So right. I think it's important to know your audience again. Uh, but mm-hmm. don't play into the audience. Like when you're doing stage, especially like if you're doing Macbeth, and or you're doing a, a comedy of errors and. And you get a laugh in the front row, the groundlings they call it on the side and the back, and they throw shit at you, and you and you stop playing to them. You never play the audience. Never come out of your out of your thing. Wow. Mm. You know, never leave your, you know, be true to your character. Right. But going into it, you know, it's always an acting. Like where you're coming from, where you're going. Every scene, in theater is easier. It's harder because it's one take, but it's easy because you're, you're, it's it's linear. Right. So I have a question mm. for you okay. then. Do you think that you know a better actor has been through more? Yes. In life. Mm. Yeah, but again, and it's funny you say that. It's the same. It's acad- academia and 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 raw talent and experience, and uh, you know a, a, a suffering, you know artiste. You know, like the one that's really digs deep. Um, and a lot of comedians are torn. I don't know if you know that, right? Uh, and people don't realize that. I know a lot of comedians. Uh, well, Robin Williams. I, mean. I met Robin Williams. I met him. You know, and uh, and. Um, I don't know him, but I've I've met him. Uh, but uh, but you mentioned him. Mm-hmm. Here's the guy who had a lot of internal conflict, right. mm-hmm. and and you know he did a lot of comedy. Then when he first did drama, people were like, oh, he's a comedian. It's Robin Williams. He's not gonna be 
dramatic, but he had so much internal conflict and so much going on in his life hmm. that when he did drama, he was great. And Eddie Murphy, he's a funny guy, and he does drama, and he's very good. So I think, like you mentioned earlier, about getting typecast, I, I don't want to ever get typecast. Right. Like, would I want to do a show for five years and play a certain character? Yeah, you know me. I don't... Yeah, it doesn't sound like you're... <laughs> nah, I mean, anything. I mean, if someone offered me, yeah, I mean, came up to me and offered me, but I've never attempted to go after something like that. Yeah, it sounds like a comedian... A good comedian, a great comedian, kind of like knows why we laugh. Yeah. It's more than just knowing how to be funny. They know why we laugh. Right. They can pull, it's almost like an analysis. They pull from their own experiences, whether it's them falling on their face or, you know, some kind of failure, and they, they adapt it and do a relatable sort of story, or depending on what you do as a comedian, where you do jokes or more story-based. It always depends, but it's. I've noticed that it's kind of the damaged artists, the tortured artists, sort of. <laughs> yeah, it kind of works in your it. favor. It does, right? in a way. <laughs> Especially when, when the you're struggle. a musician, actor, comedian, I feel like it, you draw from those. I mean, how many actors become al- al- are alcoholics or commit right. suicide? A lot. A lot of, how many musicians in the last couple of years? A lot. I'm not going to mention any names, but a lot of the musicians right. that are famous, from, like, a lot of the grunge guys. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, the Seattle grunge at whole, like the whole, yeah. you know, the whole sound garden. Allison Chains, Pearl Jam, Richard Machine, Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. Like that whole six... Or they struggle with addiction. Right. Like, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of them have OD'd or hung yeah. themselves or, or, you know, just ended up dead. And you're like, you, you think about it, this guy's on top of the world. He's right. every every chick that digs him. He has all the money in the world. He's, he's famous. He pays for nothing. And he kills himself. So do you think uh, an action film composer uh, would not give you as much as for an action movie that you might want uh, versus someone who was more diverse? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to tell you something. I would rather... Okay, if I was doing an action movie, I would rather have, a, I don't want to say, a, a drama director, but I would rather have a, a dramatic or more intense director direct a movie. Because to me, action, and and I've done a lot of action movies, and I, it's might be my least favorite to do. Right. Um, the action element of a film, it's kind of like uh, almost like second unit mm. comes in and does a big chase and the big Everything's explosion. Everything's be rigged right. up in time. You know, you're there for like one day to do a thirty second right. element of the movie. And to me, I'd rather have someone more emotional do a score. Okay. Like, you know, but you're gonna hit. You're gonna hit the anyway, and you're good with the thrillers too. Right, you, you know, you've done a lot of thrillers. You, you might be known for that. I don't know if that's your niche. Yes, I would say it is. From this, we didn't rehearse this. We just. Uh, <laughs> that's. I'm just I got going to the library of, of the Evan Evans. I got another twenty bucks for you later. Ain't it? Yeah, <laughs> twenty. It's going up. <laughs> but um, but I think having someone more emotional, doing a, bringing that to an action score because. I know action scores you those certain uh, visceral impact. Yeah, you know, dun, 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 you know that type of thing. You know, you need right. that. You're gonna, you're gonna hit that. Right. Mm. So that, that's a given. But that little ten or twenty percent of that little strings or emotion or like a lot, well, you do a lot. What Evan does a lot. Yeah. He puts. He has. He, he likes stems. Mm-hmm. So like, let's say the three of us are in a movie. Like we'll have an. It'll be a, a stem that you don't notice. A little stem for your character that'll play maybe in a different instrument later on and it's so subtle mm. you don't notice it but you notice it and we did yes. that with Templar we did that a lot with Templar right. a lot of the characters went from modern day they kind of um, reincarnated in yes. a sense but we had the same stem but maybe a medieval uh, we use a, a, a doo-doo yeah. the Armenian mm-hmm. flute and, it know, was. Yes. and we use that instrument in the Pass and then modern day we use a different score, a different string with the same stem. Yes, mm. and people that watch it the second and third time in the movie oh, caught really? some oh, things. They did. Yeah, some people wow. caught that. Wow! And but you don't realize it, and it's a familiarity between characters. So yeah, I the answer the the yeah. short answer is most definitely yes. I'd rather have a <laughs> well, like um, you know. there's a, I believe this is who said this, but I could be off, and it might be Richard Bellis. He's a composer uh, and also a teacher of film scoring and he says score uh, the uh, reason why they run not them running 
you know, provide the music which shows why they're running. The emotional. Right. Not or the, the goal. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah. right. I believe that. That makes me think, you know, immediately of a movie that I really, really enjoyed, which is quite literally almost that, which was Run All Night with Liam, Liam Neeson, you know? Mm. And almost, uh, yes. the movie was just incredibly, incredibly engaging. Why? Because the whole thing, you know, it's not really about, you know, gosh, that's a great action scene, or like if you watch Heat, you know, which might have a bit of that. But uh, it was about, you know, is he going to get away with, you know, getting justice for, for this? Or, you know, I, you really get invested into like, you know, these guys have been friends their whole life, and now they have to turn on each other uh, right. just because of the situation they have. I'm not really giving anything away because that's within the first 10 minutes of the movie. Uh, but, you know, for the rest of the movie, that motivation is there. It didn't have to. could have turned into... Any action movie, you know, score if it was scored that way, and it would have been thrilling and all, but uh, you actually got to believe that human beings could do this to each other. It's about the human element, yeah. the human condition, right? Yeah. I and mean, that's what everything is about to me. It's the human condition, the human element. You know, the, again, I said earlier, where you're coming from, where, where are you coming from, and where you're going, your motivation. I know in acting class, they see the obstacles and all the terminology. But it's just kind of common sense. I walk into this room, you know, and, and you know, I need to get a hundred bucks from you because I owe him two hundred bucks rent money and he owes me fifty bucks, but we have a side deal going on, and you're all in the room at the same time. And I gotta figure it out. How am I gonna handle this? Right. So, you know, I it's like, oh, Oh, you all showed up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what and, kind of conversations are gonna go? Right, on? so it's a different conversation. Yeah. Then, then if it was if one of you guys weren't there, or if everyone just walked around with no free association with each other, we have this like social connection. There's a dynamic, you know, yeah. between you know that's what we are. We're like this social species. So, what we do impacts other people, and to be aware of that and close that loop by acknowledging it somehow, and how you act or how you provide the music that can bring that out, you know. And that's not a stick of wood anymore. Now all of a sudden you're talking about you know how this is this is impacting um the others in the equation you know and then suddenly we can relate to that because we relate to people you know the audience you know relates to people and so if you can do something that's talking about how there's a kind of a flow a flow between people then you can be bringing that out i, I think the key and i'm not a composer but it just kind of hit me you know um <laughs> It equates to uh, acting. Like, you know how you don't anticipate. Like, let's say if you're going to ask me a question and you're going to give me the answer I want, you know, mm. and you, I'm going to ask you, you know, can I please have this? And you're going to say yes. And I'm like, oh, right. thank God. But uh. I can't I can't know that you're going to say that as an actor. If you do things a couple of times, and I've worked with act, actors, and they ask you a question, and they all know the answer already, and they anticipate the answer, and you see, like, and the, it's 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 you lose a level. And with scoring, it's the same thing where you, you want to, you know, you want to lead but not lead the audience. You know, you don't want to like, okay, the cat's gonna come out of the cupboard in a horror movie, and oh, it's just a cat, and they you turn around, it's a monster, right? Right, because you don't want to give the beats away too soon, right? You want to kind of build up and let the action. Sometimes you want to follow the action, and sometimes you want to hit it on the head. Okay. But I think with scoring, you know, some movies you see, if it's a bad score, <laughs> it, it anticipates the action. Right. And that's the last thing you want to do. And you don't want to overscore, obviously. Yeah. And you see that sometimes. You see things that's a really bad scene, right. a really bad acting. And they're hamming it up. And they, they get the to music. the... Yeah, they, they, they're they out of answers. Right. No matter how they cut it, it's kind of like, oh, wow, we got a crap scene. Yeah. You know, help us. And there's only so much you can do with the score. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you don't want to, you don't want the score monopolizing the movie. But mm -hmm. sometimes it saves movies. I've seen movies without the score. Because I, I've had probably like twenty or thirty times people have asked me to come to their their house or their studio and say, "Hey, do me a favor, watch this." Yeah. yeah. You know, what do you what do you see? Okay. You know, I did it with you at one time. You got you doing some editing on a movie one time. You're an editor. Okay. And he was playing a scene. I was talking to you. I went, you know, reverse that shot and. I forget the guy's name. It was on the place in Calabasas. Yeah. And you were laughing. Yeah. The guy goes, what? And I go, just try that. And we kept on talking. The guy turned the whole thing around. He goes, how'd you see that? 
Yeah. And you and I were like, how oh, didn't he see it? <laughs> right. How, how could you not see that? You know, <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's a tricky thing. Scores are. I was watching a TV show last night, and it had this droning, perpetual score through every scene. And a lot of movies are doing it like that. A lot of those B movies, mm-hmm. and it's like those B action movies. It's that same droney score. Yeah. For ninety minutes. I think after a while, all that does is just tell you that you know there's not a lot of dialogue you have to pay attention to here. <laughs> right. Yeah, true, true. Right. You know, and then you end up because the score, if it's guiding you too much, if it's too much, so I'm saying. You know, then it's a music video. I mean, we detach from checking out the visual. It becomes noise. Yeah. Everything becomes noise. Too much information. People expect the score to guide them. Right. They do. They just, even unconsciously, they want, it's the helping hand in a way, you know? Yeah. And so going back to what you said before about uh, using it for anticipation, you know, um, I think part of that is like the score can also provide context. You know, it's like, okay, let's give them a little context. And then all of a sudden, you know, the black guy comes out of the cover and you're like, whoa, you know. You don't want that context to be too big in that particular situation. You So paying attention to context is a good way to, to get to get that in the right, uh, you know, framing. It's definitely a character to me. The score is a character in the movie. Um, the the camera, depending on the, on the DP, can be a character. Like it can be like Orson Welles, say, for example. Oh, yeah. Orson Welles... His score and his uh, camera angles, yeah. innovation, mm-hmm. it becomes a character. Mm-hmm. Not if, it's, if it's a character. That's a really great way to think of it. Yeah, it's you know, almost like you have, okay, what do I have to work with here when you, before you're making a movie, right? You can, if you're that kind of a level of filmmaker, what do I have to work with here? Well, we can do stuff with music. We can do stuff with cameras. We can do stuff with actors. We can do stuff with the literary words that we say. We can even pull out and have a narrator. We can, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of, like you say, almost characters that can be used differently. But a lot of people don't really maybe, maybe elements is a better word. Elements, but, you yeah. know, and a lot of people don't really leave the space for those other elements to have a place to say something as well. Because you look at like Hitchcock and you look at Orson Welles' work and music is very uh, uh, complimentary. It's, it's yeah. like, it's, it, sometimes, you know, Alfred Hitchcock would say, uh, you know, don't make, don't make uh, show the audience, you know, what the problem is so that they can have a certain anxiety about uh, that the fact that some of the characters in the film don't even know what it is yet. You know, and so you can, he maybe could leave that to music to illustrate. Oh my God, there's a bomb under the table, you know, and these guys don't realize it. And he can know. Okay, how can I do that? Well, one of the devices I can use is I'll just leave that to music, you know. So, or you about Hitchcock. Yeah, that's Hitchcock. Yeah, yeah, he also said that actors were cattle. Okay, <laughs> that was the thing about actors. <laughs> yeah, no, he would. They were basically. He believed actors were cattle, <laughs> and I was like, wow, what a. <clears throat> well, Orson Welles is a better example. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but no, but I'm saying, but then I think about it with Hitchcock, and I did my first film, and I'm doing my second one now. Yeah, he's kind of right. <laughs> yeah, they are just, yeah, they're this. Like, I think it was maybe Cary Grant or somebody was trying to ask about, you know, how do you want me to, you know, come into the room and, like, walk, do you want me to walk over to, like, be over here as opposed to over here? He says, This is why I hired you. Open the door and get in the room. You know, yeah. Alfred Hitchcock. You know, it's like you hire the good actors, you give them the script. What is this we're making here? Are we making right. a story, or are we trying to put it together? Was, yeah, a I mean, commercial? it's um, the guy I'm working for now for the pirate film. I I did the first day, and you know, um, I never look in the monitor, mm-hmm. and I I don't do it. I'll I look in the monitor when he's shooting somebody else, just to see the framing. Just is you know how he's framing things. If he's, he's doing like a, you know, you know what I mean? Is he? But when I go on in front of the camera, I'm, I'm done. I'm 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 punched in. It's his movie, right? You I'm can't. A, and I don't want to get in my own head about what I'm doing. Right. So I just kind of. But I, it's the first day is always. Without, I'm on the phone for three weeks, and the first day is always one of those. Uh, Hi, how are you? how are you? How are you? The, the DP. Yeah. It's like you know, and and I always ask. Every everything I've ever done, whether it's a day player or a lead, with the DP, I'm like, what's my frame? Is is this in frame? You know, okay. And, and I, it's just so I know my boundaries. Okay. And then I just turn it off. It's like when you learn an accent. When you learn an accent for a movie, 
when you get there, you turn it off. You and you just become that that thing, that entity for yeah the entire shoot. But it's um, you have to know your framing, so you don't go in a lot out of frame like you know. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> You get back in the frame, but the first day was kind of like um, I did something, and I uh, I did the second take. You know, like I mentioned earlier, I did I did I was Satan for the first take. Then right. I was you know, and I went up to him and I said, I said, did you want that? That's what you wanted, right, for the film? And he goes, yeah. I said, okay, I'm just being an insecure actor. <laughs> and I'm around, and he started laughing. Uh, so the next day we go on the boat. We have a, a, a boat built on the studio, and uh. And I had lived, and it's always like actually it was the same day later in the day, and I I had lived a lot. I have, I have a tendency to, uh, yeah. As a script, yeah, okay, here, whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. What's what's a key? What's a, say say banana? Okay, I'll, I'll I'll get that in there some at some point. I get the word banana in there. Yeah, I'm unleashed. And uh and and so there was a moment where the guy in the our, my our new captain. He we leave. We escape from uh, Malcolm McDowell from Clockwork Orange. Yeah, he's the bad guy. He's a bad captain, and we go on our own. And I'm like the right hand of the new captain, you know. And uh, and we're doing this moment where he's we just escape from Malcolm McDowell. First five minutes of the movie, we're on the boat, and the guy turns. Our new captain he turns. He looks at Malcolm McDowell almost like a like a child leaving the nest. You know, like a bird leaving the nest. Like, did I make the right decision when we took the map? It's a, you know, we're floating away, and I'm, I'm looking at him, and I have this look because you know I'm there to support him. I'm a supporting actor in the movie, right. and I'm looking at him with this like love and admiration, like you know, like he's gonna be my new captain. You know, we're gonna leave the the tyranny of Mark McDowell, and his thought going, I can see it in his eyes. I'm, I'm in the moment. He's looking like he's a great look in his face, and he's looking away like. Did I just make the right move? And I'm escaping, and a thousand things going through his head. And I come from behind him. I just had lived, and I said, "You know, like welcome aboard, Captain." Wow. Mm -hmm. And he turns, and he goes, "Captain," and I'm like, "It's your ship now." And he has a smile on his face. He's like, "Captain, man, the boat!" And he, and he goes up, <laughs> and, and, and it's almost like passing the torch to him. It was right. Eric Eric Balfour was wow. the was the was the actor that plays the the swa handsome swashbuckler. I'm the guy with the big beard. <laughs> Arr, like it out. And so, uh, and so I just saw it at the moment, and I'm thinking, it's selfless. It's, it's a selfless act. I'm supporting him, right? But I'm realizing, if he comes on the boat and he turns around to the audience and he says, looks away, and he goes, "All right, man, the boat." It's just another another dictatorship going on, right? So it's 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 much better having the unassuming hero, call it, mm -hmm. you know, where I talk about you, how great you are, and you walk in a room, and I say, oh, Eric's, a, uh, I mean, Evans, Evans, a great composer, this and that, and then you walk in the room and you you tap your fingers, and people are like, oh, he's making a, making he's composing something, <laughs> as opposed to you walk in the room and you're like, I'm a great composer, mm -hmm. and people are like, oh, they're turned off by it. So <laughs> I do the line, you know, welcome aboard, Captain. It's your ship now, and he turns around and uh, and I have this look on my face, like really, like a loving, adoring, you know, like he's our captain now, mm -hmm. and it makes him look like a god. And even he's a tall guy, Eric. Even like I kind of crouched down a little bit, <laughs> you know, the like, oh, I'll go to the captain, Arr, you know, <laughs> and uh, and we do the take, and I this is a big, that's a big improv, yeah, you know, but I, I stepped into his frame, right? Even I mean, though it's yes. we're in the same frame. I really still mind. Right. I, I, I just went right into it. And I and uh and uh they and then they I guess I was so compelling the DP kept the camera on me when Eric walks out of frame. And I don't know the camera was still on me. So my action was after that like to untie the boat the link between us. And out of just out of like almost comically not comically, but out of like just I don't know, I went ta ta Captain Lynch. But really, like, oh. you know, like that, that's Captain Lynch's Malcolm McDowell. It's a talk, Captain Lynch. <laughs> like, you know, and then I'm like this, and I'm like, am I still on camera? I'm like, oh, God, he's filming me. <laughs> and I did it so over the top, like, joking around almost. Yeah. And then I mixed in the background, he's off camera going, was that really necessary? <laughs> so, and then, the, and then I, I went to say something to Rick, Rick Spall, the, the director, and he yells out, 
when I did my little extra, he went, professional acting. So I said, okay, he just gave me the green light for three weeks. Wow. So, uh, Very good. Yeah. I was on day two. Oh, that was kind of, actually, that was day one. Day one, yeah. That was wow. the first day, you know, so I was like, he kind of said like, and we basically did everything in one take. Like, we just shot everything in one take. Wow. You know? Incredible. Wow. That's amazing. I think Holly, uh, let's see. Holly says, uh, good perspective with the actor today. <laughs> Where is he? That, is, that actor would be Paul Sampson, and also an amazing filmmaker and editor. And I'm not really an editor. He's not an actual editor, but I can't. You know, really, I, I'm. I have no, that's what makes you a filmmaker, though. I have no You're technical everything. skills. Exactly. I have no technical skills. I, I rely on people like these guys. <laughs> I can't turn a switch. I clap, edit. Just I talk to the machine, but nothing happens. So, uh, let's see. Uh, just um, the, yeah, go ahead. No, I think that's so cool because it's almost like you're not even using the lines. Like, it's like you're getting more into who the character is. Like, like you, you, somehow you're getting into the character and, like, it's it's just kind of cool to see. And Evan showed me some of your other stuff and it's like you really get into it. It's like not just, like, saying the lines. Or yeah. Anything. This guy, Brad Potts, called me yesterday. And uh, they want to do a movie end of the year, uh, kind of like that movie with John Wayne, uh, True Grit. Oh wow! Oh, it's okay. old, it, they want to do like a little movie with that this guy Billy Pons and direct it. And uh, and I'm gonna play half Indian, half breed. Mm-hmm. Which you look at me now with the big beard, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. But I have big giant alien cheekbones and the jaw. <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll happen. But um, but Brad told me he called up Billy and said Billy you realize when you give Samson the role he's just gonna do something different with it and Billy said I, mean, I expect it wow mm-hmm. so you know I mean one time I did a movie for Tony Topaz and uh, they played a joke on me I showed up it was uh, I showed up the, maybe the second week I showed up and you know they give you the sides yes before you go on yeah, they give you the yeah. glue sides and, and it had my character name and his name was a scene between us, like a three-page scene, and it had all his dialogue, and it had my name, and it was blank. They had no dialogue for three pages, just my just my character name with blank. <laughs> and then his character two walks in, they, they talk, and then two walks out, and then it's me and Tony again talking. I mean, a little guidance would be good, right? And 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 I said, um, I said, Tony, I said, you cut my lines, <laughs> and they played me. Is the whole crew was they wait for the whole crew to be around? I came on trail. I said, Tony, you cut my lines. I mean, you know, am I doing that bad of a job? He goes, no, I just figured, you know, you're going to say whatever the F you want anyway, so <laughs> why bother writing it? Uh-huh. And I went, okay, <laughs> you know. Well, that's the way it is with, with composing, really. If you're going to really get to that level, get to that next level, you're not just reading the lines and mm. acting, you know. You're understanding the purpose of why you're in the room. Yeah. You know, and you're understanding what's the motivation, what's the story, what are we pushing here, what's this narrative we're going after. Right. So, would you right. rather have? Would you rather have a director say, "Okay, Evan, here's, here's my film," you know, the the the, the lock picture, because I know the audience knows that. You you know, what happens is you lock picture, and once you lock picture, you know, it's done, and then you call the correct, and you do sound, and you do the composition, and all that stuff. Would you rather have the director saying, "Here's a lock picture." Do what you want. I'll see you in a month and see what you come up with. Or would you rather have him like sitting beside you and say, "Oh, I want this and that." And how do you feel about that? Well, uh, I, 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 I'm the type, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but I think it, it is something that I recommend, and it works great. Um, I, I'd rather like we bunk up, man. Like twenty four seven, this is it. Like we are making this story happen. Like, but I know that they have to go and work on special effects, and they have to work on post audio, and they have to work on you know pickups and reshoots and all that. So I understand they can't give me too much time, but uh, I have no insecurity about having the director there with me while I'm creating, while I'm thinking, because everything I'm creating, I want has a real deep meaning and a purpose and I want to run that deep meaning and purpose by them. I don't really need them for like the craft. I I got that like they can go take a nap or whatever. But would you rather have them the first the first week right in your tail or would you rather have like a week by yourself or a couple of days by yourself? I mean of course I probably would want to have like a, a 
a couple watch throughs uh, by myself but like I'll give you a good example um, yesterday uh, I got approached to score a movie that's basically like 1928 Brooklyn uh, about some young kids you know in 1928 Brooklyn and it's shot like you know once upon a time in America like Sergio Leone it's just gorgeous and everything mm -hmm. my immediate thought was let's try and do something like an electronic mm -hmm. score on this you know I mean that's like I wanted if I put a, a typical traditional Americana score on that I've seen it a hundred times we have that already what do you mean by electronic like you know maybe we could do something that's like a more sound design ambient um, electronic score that's you know more in the realm of like uh, Wendy Carlos did for like let's say Tron but not not sci-fi sounding but something that I've I've done this kind of thing before I did another film for about a Chinese immigrant who was accused of uh, having AIDS before AIDS was known what it was and so she was ousted from her village ridiculed went to the New York City and uh, it becomes like a coming of age story and it's just a just a regular old drama okay but I did an all electronic score sort of like a Vangelis or something like that and it elevates it to just this whole other level you know, another one might be like The Bounty with uh, Mel Gibson. You ever seen that? That has a Vangelis mm -hmm. score. It's like, wow. What? If... He also did the same thing with like 1492 Conquest of Paradise with uh, Gerard Depardieu. Huh. And, you know, to do that with a particular... If a subject matter has been done a lot, if you're doing it again, then all you really have left reason-wise to make that story available to people is whatever's different about it. So I got to find, you know, what, what's that really different thing that we're trying to say here? And I just can bring that out by exposing it musically. I can expose that microscopic difference of an idea. And I can even do that in a fresh way. I mean, we saw things like that happen with the film It Follows. It uh, had a very electronic score and all of a sudden it was like, wow, we can create almost like an 80s nostalgia throwback score and then boom, now the floodgates were open. You know, Stranger Things on Netflix, you know, basically did that same approach. This whole 80s throwback started to happen. We just recently had Ready Player One, you know, with uh, 80, it's total 1984 throwback, you know. I don't know, I, probably now we're on the downswing, I think. Right. <laughs> We've exploited the that thing. But I mean, you've got to do something fresh. You know, I really like 70s music for sure I you was know. just going to start to open up about talking about Night of the Temple yeah I mean it's a little bit before my time but you know I but I what a great rawness to the 70s music I mean you have the a lot of the artists they just like Janis Joplin and the Jimi Hendrix they just bled yeah. when they performed and even like Joe Cocker yeah I mean Joe Cocker I yeah. mean exactly I mean those guys were just out there just wow or uh, Hendrix, yeah. Yeah, like uh, even like that group Mongo Jerry in the summer in the summertime. Oh. Did -a -did -a -did -a -did -a -did -it. Just all that stuff and the stuff we used in Temple, the seventies music. The the seventies music it's, it has a rawness to it. You know, yeah. and I just I just like I might keep the beard for a while. I don't know. <laughs> regress yeah. into the set. But I'm also thinking, like, when you say that, like, what would it be like, you know, in this nineteen twenty eight twenty eight Brooklyn film to just you know, that's why, you know, I, I try to teach the other composers, please think outside the box. Like Herbie Hancock, who I met when I was about 11 or 12 years old, told me in a personal personal conversation some advice. He said, you got to think outside the box, but not inside a bigger box. Mm -hmm. You know, be open-minded and really <laughs> meaningfully open-minded. And, you know, I am not against, when I get hired as a composer, us having no score. <laughs> Hey, look, that can be quite an amazing approach. You know, look what uh, Dave Grusin did for The Firm. Uh, he was asked to score. They approached him to score the film, The Firm. Um, and uh, then he said, okay, but I want to do it with all piano, just like an entire piano score. I think that's the best Well, approach. that's what I'm thinking of, the one I'm doing now. You know, I, I play that waltz I, I wrote, you know, the one for the movie I'm doing in New York mm. City. I'm doing a... I'm doing like a really urban kind of like a taken meets payback, mm -hmm. but very emotional film, and I've been shooting it uh, on and off between films. Yeah. You know, when people are not hiring me, I go back and I, I do a day or two on it. You know, it's been a 25 day shoot in the end, but I've got like, I'm past halfway now. But I, I don't really want to. Uh, it's New York City. And it, you know, it's not like 
you know, thank you, you very much. Thank yeah, you. you know, I don't want that. And, Enough um, of that already. Right, right. And, and I want, you know, like that drony throughout the entire film. And I want a grittiness to it. Not like when you watch, and I have nothing against TV, but when you watch Friends, it's clean and loving in a Sex in the City. Mm-hmm. I want the other side, like the underbelly of New York the City. Darker, yeah. The darker, gritty, almost a 70s film, even though it's mm-hmm. modern day. I want that gritty kind of feel. And there's... Um, I don't play the piano. I don't play an instrument. I played. I used to play bass and sing just by listening, not by, you know, listen. But I wrote a waltz, you know. That's uh, not true. He was just playing drums yesterday. No, he's, uh, these guys are way better drums. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm like an ape on the drums. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so I... Uh, I, I want I played a piano like a really I this wrote a waltz and I sent it to you and I played it and everyone's oh it's pretty good would you get that from me? I said I wrote it <laughs> so but I might give Evan that and have him make stems from it and maybe just go with that just that waltz what's it three beats so dun, dun, dun. Uh-huh. three four yeah three right beats. Three, four, so maybe even slow it down at times and yeah. speed it up but just I might go to piano I might have you do a mm-hmm. piano score for my film one of the cool things that you can do is and Steve and I were just talking about this earlier is you can take the sounds of an instrument and uh, you know you can reverse them stretch them great lots of interesting like so that's what Dave Grusin did in uh, The Firm is like he went into the piano he like brushed the strings he was knocking on the table you know, creating beats like that. Right. Um, it works in that movie because that movie right. is about like these upper class, upper crust people. It's about uh, kind of and like it, a it's little... a lot of suspense. Yeah, and it, it's a suspense. And it's a times of the essence kind of movie. The firm, sure, sure. Well, Tom Cruise, right? Yes, right, right. And I can see how that would work. And it, it, there's a lot of anticipation in that movie. Yes. So I can see how that would work. Yes. Um, again, we we're talking about elements, or I was saying characters at first, and elements. I think. I'm just realizing now, I guess I realized it before, but maybe I'm, I'm putting it out verbally. I think a key element of the film I'm making now is going to be the, the sound of the city. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Right? Yeah. And I'm saying, like, the traffic and the noise and the yeah. bus and the beeping. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you were watching it, um, when the train goes by and the screeching noise of the train, and then it, it could wake you from a, from a daydream. I, I have a perpetual amount of flashbacks in the movie. Um... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is why it's taking the movies that take longer to shoot because you know when you watch a film a, a big film and they'll do a flashback for maybe eight seconds but they paid like you know a half a million dollars to make it yeah. I'm kind of doing that on a low end budget <laughs> where I'm setting up an entire I set up an entire day and just did like six flashbacks yeah. for over 12 hours and I just got certain flashbacks but I think the sound of New York City is a is a, a character or an element a context. A context. You know, it's it's that is throughout the whole movie. So I think that and um, the solemn moments might be the piano, like piano, mm-hmm. just light. Mm-hmm. So I think this one, as opposed to Night of the Templar, which is a medieval, you know, at least a third of it is medieval. It's you know, medieval movies are more heavily scored, obviously. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, so we can take like the sound of a, of a single piano note, even. And e flat, you can uh, <laughs> take it and you can stretch it with this stuff called granular synthesis, and you can you can freeze a moment in time and have it just stretch and pitch shift. Yeah. You can create incredible, you know. And a piano could be really good for that because it has it's made from metal. A lot of everything that you're hearing is basically like metal resonance, yeah. and that works in an urban environment. Like mm. look at that poster on the wall, right? I mean, we've got a guitar with metal strings and an urban urban environment and it kind of goes together concrete metal are there any concrete instruments that you have at your disposal uh, yeah we can we can find some <laughs> the, the rubbing of bricks you yeah. can see on one end uh. with bricks and him with concrete well Christopher Young uh, one, of the, one of the great film composers uh, who did um, The Fly 2 and also um, what is this uh, Hellraiser the Hellraiser mm-hmm. movies and, okay. he's, and he's currently working uh, on tons of movies uh, for example, he threw a piano off of a roof one time and recorded it. So you know, he was fired the next day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the city came by and said, "What are you going to do about this hole in the ground?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was fined, also fined. And... <laughs> but uh, but man, what a story! 
Oh God, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, he used it for you know some kind of calamitous sound in his in his music. But you know, you can. There's a lot of high end on a piano as much as a low end. So when you drop it, even though it has a lot of low notes, it also has a lot of high notes. And so if you slow the sound down, let's say half or even a quarter speed, mm -hmm. now you're starting to take all of the calamitous high end sounds and bring them down in the normal range. And they might be doing something different than the mid range notes yeah. might do ordinarily. And so you can really bring out different aspects of the Right. Point. What I do with my film, I, I play the piano for the, the waltz and it's one of those like, um, I'm, I'm in a tough place and uh, the brother that dies, he's challenged and he wants me, like the last time I see him, he wants me to play, make, write a song for him. You know, so it's kind of a little bit heart wrenching when I'm playing, it's heart wrenching. But the whole gist of it is the piano's been out of tune for like, you know, years or nine months or a year because I've been played since my, my mom died in the movie. So I'm brushing the piano off and, I, and I, I'm beside myself, but now he's, he's dead and his last request was for me to write this song for him. So I'm really emotional. And um, it's kind of the, the turning point for when I, I get off my ass, basically, in the movie. And then I seek the vengeance. I go, my, but it's the last thing I do before I go out there. And, and I brush the piano off and I'm talking to myself and it's, it's out of tune. It's in, and when I play, it's, it's so haunting being out of tune. And, just, I, and it becomes, and a buddy of mine was there and he goes, dude, you should tune your piano <laughs> I'm like no I don't want to be pretty you're missing the point right, leave right. I just I threw him out of that apartment <laughs> I'm like you're, not, you're missing it you're missing the point of it I don't want to be I don't there's, want there's a backstory to what it's, 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 it's a suffering yeah it's like Alice in Chains that group Alice in Chains back yeah, in the day thing. they would tune up to like E flat they have more of a heavy the bass player they, they had a heavier sound yeah and it just gives you that different resonance you know it's like that um you know, yeah. it's just... Uh, it can, you can tighten it up, loosen it up, yeah. different than the norm. Right, so I'm, I'm going for... Um, I'm just telling Evan now in advance. <laughs> Don't make it too pretty. I'm going for a piano score and not a pretty one. Yeah, not a pretty one at that. <laughs> Kai was like, I can't play piano. You're hired. Who's <laughs> 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 my worst piano player here? Yeah. <laughs> the maid's in the corner. I know that uh, Marco Beltrami uh, did a lot of interesting stuff with the piano for the movie Logan, which I didn't see. Did you see? I saw Logan? Logan. Yeah. And do you remember that? It's supposed to give it a lot of a very distressed and. You know uh, what? I, I gotta watch it again. Yeah. Yeah. For that. Write that down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, highlight it. Yeah, Logan and Marco Logan. Beltrami was in the situation where the the studio didn't really know what they which way they were gonna go with that movie uh, score score wise, with demographic wise, angle wise, direction wise. Mm. They they're like you know they had quite a heavy subject matter there yeah and we're gonna play it traditionally we're gonna play it. so actually uh, he ended up writing uh, four or five different ways to score every scene so in less wow. than thirty days uh, he recorded um, all kinds of stuff and they just they really started thinking outside the box he and his crew uh, did all kinds of crazy stuff with the piano did orchestral sessions but in the end they went with the stuff that was very like just intimate it was just like a piano or a guitar like less is more less is more kind of a yeah day. that's how i want to go with this one. tired and traveled old and distressed you know yeah and uh you know that's just part and parcel with you know bringing ideas to the table that's great i mean you hire michael Beltram marco baltrami or any great composer with an open mind and you can go that distance. And I was, in a, I was in a, one of the greatest. I was in a higher Evan Evans. <laughs> <laughs> one of the greatest superhero movies, uh, you know, around. You know. Yeah. Well, you owe me, tw you owe me twenty bucks more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pay my rent at this rate. So now we get to the point where you know I think we should ask you some questions. I think maybe Kyle maybe has some. Um, Stephen has some. If you're out there in the audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into your uh, platform that you're all watching us on, and uh, we'll get them and we'll we'll go ahead. And what are the the, the, the female ourselves, whatever you like the to female, ask. The female commented earlier. She asked you something. Oh, uh, Holly. Oh yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> she have a question or she just. Oh, she was just saying, you know, good perspective with the actor today, you know. Oh, okay. We could talk about perspective. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I just didn't know. No, I have some questions. Um, so, in working with a composer, uh, what would you, so therefore, when you're selecting a composer, because a lot of composers are going to want to oh, know this, yeah. okay? When you're selecting a composer, number one, how important to you in that selection process, because they need to know this, is what degree they have. 
I mean, uh, academically? Yeah. Okay, I'm not a good... And we're not saying anything against academia. Yeah, no, I'm not a good person to ask um, <laughs> because, I mean, a lot of people um, get a casting director. Uh, if you look up my film, Night with an N, Night of the Templar, um, I cast everyone. And I have so many people in the film. I have like 60 or 70 Crusader guy, guys in the thing. I have 20... Uh, of the Templar uh, Freemason people in, the, in this, and I have actors and so many people horses horses and people I got like you know, 10 people 12, 12 13 people riding their horses and well those are horse people <laughs> but <laughs> I mean that horse is not good enough <laughs> I, I need a bigger horse yes yeah. But I mean, actually, uh, that happened, didn't I? I think you were telling me a story about. No, I had some big, I had some you huge got horses, really huge that. horses, like yeah. seventeen half hands. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're big horses, and they actually were easily easier to handle than the more scrappy ones, like the fifteen handers. Interesting. Yeah, was there more just? I think that's the same way with with short people. You know, they just tend to be more. Uh, uh, well, it's kind of the opposite because they're big <laughs> horses, so they, you know, they have nothing to worry about. Yeah. I don't know about that. I don't. I've, I've never right. tried to ride a short person. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just. The oh, you mean in general? In oh, I did. I did. As far as riding, them. that's a bucket list thing. Yeah, <laughs> but you were saying. And if I buy my shorter people, it's how to five eleven. Okay, come on, you're too tall. So, so you, you, you most of the time they have a casting director. Right, and I I did it myself. I did it. I did it myself, and it took so long. And I have some. Decent names in the movie. I don't want to drop names. If you guys look it up, you can look it up. But uh, I mean, I have some big names in the movie. If Middle like name. The Walking Dead. You're gonna like Night of the Templar for a reason. Go check it out. <laughs> All right, a little side thing. Uh, some big names, some medium names, some no names, and just vary. So I went through every single submission, and I did it old school. I okay. did it. I wanted. A, I this is a, well, this is a little bit a long time ago now, half dozen years longer, but I wanted paper male submissions with the headshot and the resume on it I don't want all that like the one I'm doing now it's electric submissions okay. the one I'm doing now um, and the composer is it was kind of when I shot that film it was right on the cusp when people would still send you a DVD right like you sent me a DVD and you had a hand on it yes that's right see how's that for memory wow good memory yeah wow. and I got I don't know how many composers I got their submissions from I mean a lot because it, you know it's a Templar movie, Night of the Templar, and mm. it's like acting wise. So let me segue for a second. When you're acting, okay, blah 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 is acting in a movie. It's an action movie. You want you to play a role. It's an action movie. Blah blah. It's a B movie. It's a dime a dozen. You know, do I want to do it? I'd, I'd rather do a play mm -hmm. than not do it. Even though I need money, it's the same thing. But I'm doing a kids pirate movie. Like, how many times am I going to be offered? How many movies are made? Besides the Pirates of the Caribbean, how many kids' pirate movies are made? I don't know any. It's the first one I've heard of. Well, maybe since Goonies, you know. Well, that's, yeah. But, and that's not even a pirate movie. Right. But you know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, so that came about, and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm interested in that one. And a lot of composers, um, it's a challenge. You get to compose a medieval movie or a time period. I mean, yeah, there's like 300, and there's. I'm not all, you know, uh, and there's uh, Braveheart, and there's Gladiator, and but those are the top three or four composers in the world get those movies, and there's one every so many years. So when my movie came out and it hit the hit the the, the computer or the internet, that it, it, I was getting a lot of composers mm -hmm. because it's a chance to do something different. Yeah. So every composer in like. I don't want to say in the country. I mean, <laughs> in the world. Not every. I mean, I had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, and it went on forever of CDs. So I didn't look at their um, what's good. Resume. To. Yeah, I just listened to their stuff. You know, and uh, and that's over and over. And I made. I made, I had so mm -hmm. many DVDs. I mean, uh, CDs. Yeah. And DVDs of things they scored, how it, you know, correlated, and yes. and and I've had links, and God, I had buckets of deep, uh, <laughs> DVDs and CDs, and it took me a month, yeah, to to really go through it, yeah, and and the headshots, 
I was going to the post office. Oh, Ten thousand of them or more. God. Right? Oh, wait, I just did um, for the the girl in my movie, Electronic Submission. I had over two thousand and two, over twenty two hundred submissions wow. For, wow. to play my sister, my movie, wow. electronically. One character. One character. Wow. One character. <laughs> I had twenty two hundred electronically, <laughs> and I'm like, and I went for every one of them. Yeah. Oh. I was for every one of them and I know a lot of people don't do that a lot of I'm a nut like that too yeah I know we're, we're the same <laughs> I mean when I did the skull with Evan we also, also helped me do the final edit we really are particular so I know a lot of directors and I don't consider myself a director director I'm like an actor who can direct because it's kind of common sense to me mm. you just you know I don't know it's not that difficult I mean the great minds are like on a different level but the basic, you know, nuts and bolts, it's pretty easy. Um, but, but I um, I think the main thing is to put your best foot forward, you know, when, whenever you're playing for a job. If you can, like if you're doing a comedy, you want to submit something comedic <laughs> to the director. Right. You know, and uh, if you went to Berkeley, I'm just using Berkeley again, because I don't really know too many music schools that are... <laughs> Berkeley School of Music. Yeah, like that, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, with acting, with, with acting, I do look at their background sometimes, where they, where they went, where they studied. Yeah. Because I, I understand that better Okay. as an actor. Right. Like, but as a director looking at a com- composer, me, this is me personally. Yeah. I don't really know uh, the pecking order of schools. Right. Mm. Like, did you go to college? Or? Okay, did you go to college? Yeah. Ivy League. Right. Which one? Yeah, Steve was uh, Mary Steen. What, Columbia? Columbia, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Where'd you go? Oh, I was in school in Florida. Yeah, I was in United States. No, no. <laughs> Give a prop. Give a prop. No, actually, it was an excellent program. It was uh, St. Saint Peter's, Saint Petersburg College. Uh, it was. It's a the Mirror program, music industry and recording arts. And I got to tell you, it's a small program right now. It's still kind of fledgling, but... For the academia you, you receive, for the really hands-on, really close, small sort of classroom, it was excellent. It was an ex- it was excellent finding that in Florida mm. of all places. Good for you. you know, it was uh, very and very as you're, happy. as you're saying that, Steve's going <laughs> <laughs> Columbia, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Columbia, by the way. <laughs> so you know, so I, I mean, but I mean, I I think. But does that tell you, you know, for me how personally, good it's going to be the music. No, I mean it's, it's experience, but again. You know, you've learned things in Columbia, uh, Columbia, in, in Florida, and, and those things made you a better composer. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's a different animal. I'm not a good person to ask, but I'm <laughs> kind of a guy that's so like, I want to see what you've done, and right, yes. And a lot of times, a lot of actors and people involved, um, I like giving people a shot. Not with you, why you 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 are an abuser of talent, but I like giving people a shot uh, as far as editors and and. Um, just a lot of things. I like people that try, you know, that, that have a lot of ambition. I don't like attitude, you know. Well, yeah. Because I have so much of my own. Unless it's something no, that I'm you sure. can really dig, right? You know. Yeah, but I mean, I don't want to put up with attitude. I mean, when you're, you know. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, yes. I like attitude. I like. Uh, it shouldn't be a layer lies, between you. I like swag. Right. But no, I don't like. Not people. a barrier between you. No. Yeah, I don't like that too, too cool for school. Right, right. You know, and I've known a couple of editors, um, even for what I'm doing now, they were like, okay, so give me give me the drives, and I'll have a rough cut for you in, in, in three weeks. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, right. You know me. <laughs> you know me. I, I'm like, God, you want to go micromanaging. Yeah. I'm like, I'll sit in your lap in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, three frames, two frames, three frames. Nope, nope. Okay, try that. Put that in. Okay, and okay, one frame, two frames. Okay, stop <laughs> Wake up. Wake up. Okay, one frame, two frame. <laughs> Just move over. You know. Uh, Just move over. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know how to work this thing. Okay, sit back down again. Okay, two frames. And I'm like that with... Um, everything. With the, yeah, with everything. It, it, to me, if you're going to make a movie, and I've been in so... At least two-thirds of movies I've made, maybe even higher, maybe 80%, the director gets the material, gives it to the uh, editor, and he sees the rough assembly. And you know we, he, Eric, uh, Evan actually helped me cut another template the last round of it. I go through every frame, <laughs> even the ones that aren't circled, of the takes that aren't circled. There's so many nuances. You know when the actors 
And I had a thing with the last one. I did it again with this one, but I did it with Night of the Temple a lot. A couple of the actresses, they weren't natural on film. And I went to the DP a couple of times. I said, look, I'm going to yell cut, but don't cut. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a dirty bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and the girl was on a tight... I'm not going to say which actress. Uh, you know. Which, yeah. Oh, I, rem- I yeah, know what okay, you're talking yep, about. Yep, zip them up. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a tight frame, and I needed certain reactions from a couple of them. And when the camera was on, they were too much like this. Mm. Yes. I am acting. <laughs> and then they were more like this when the camera was off of them, you know? Right. And I just was off camera and I needed reaction shots and I did this two different days. Oh, wow. And I would be off frame and I needed them over there doing something. I knew I was cutting at my head and I needed to be over there doing something, a certain reaction. So I would start telling a joke but I do it really serious and really weird, like, oh. and these two leprechauns walking down the street. And the girl would go like this. <laughs> like, what the F is he talking about? And I used the take because I needed her to be inquisitive because in the movie, I don't want to say, give me more. And then oh, I would... I just... You know played, I'm about. I know the exact take you're talking about. Yeah. Which I you, didn't you, know that's what went down. Right. And then I get halfway through the frame... And I'd be like this. <laughs> like, and they go back this one. <laughs> and then I say something really funny and go like this. And I used every take of it, you know, and uh, I did to every, almost everybody, just so I did it too. I did to like the big names too. Yeah, uh, yeah I did to, I was so to every, but I realized it was really natural reactions. Wow. And um, I, had, I had a joke that we basically can't tell, but. <laughs> yeah. About DC, but. Uh, but I, I mean, so. I don't know what, what that came about, but I mean, yeah. it, it's sometimes you get people, mm. but everyone could be, uh, everyone's a type, like we're all types, like right. Steve's doing this, yeah. you're doing that, <laughs> you're doing this, I'm doing this, and you know, in a movie, you want real types, you want to go to a, a gas station, have the gas guy fill up your, your, your automobile, the, the attendant, and you don't want him acting. Yeah, guys, gonna come and put the gas in your car. Yeah, it should just be guy. And, and if you had a camera hidden, like when I was like little, called little ones. Yeah, oh, yeah. Body cam. Yeah. Hidden yeah. cam. Um, what's a little? Is it? A, oh, like a GoPro. Like a GoPro. A GoPro. Oh, duh. <laughs> um, so if you had a GoPro in in, the, in your jacket, you know, mm. and and you know, everyone's conscientious of the camera. Mm-hmm. I'm not so much anymore. I mean, you know, because I don't really give a shit. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, I'm just kidding. But um, but everyone's conscientious of the camera, and, and when there's no camera, everybody in the world is an actor, because you know you need normal people in a movie. Right. Not everyone can be like, look at me. I'm the I'm the clown. There's people watching the clown in the audience, and if the audience is watching, if you're like a twenty person, twenty people watching a, a moment, and they don't know they're being taped, you know, it's very. Genuine, yes. or, I guess organic. You know, they use that term. I hate that term. Very organic, like eggs, you know, or chicken. My free range eggs. Yeah, <laughs> organic farm fresh eggs and actors too. Um, so, so when you have the camera, when it, when there's a, when they don't know they're being filmed, it's beautiful. Pasture raised mm. actors. Pasture raised yeah. <laughs> cage reactors. Cage reactors. Yeah, Nicholas Cage reactors. And so and so um yeah and so it's. When they think the camera's off, uh, that defense goes off, yeah. and 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 they become human beings, and that's why the better movies, you have the better actors. Does that does that go away? Does that start to happen with experience? Is that uh, I've worked with a lot of actors. Do they ever lose that? Uh, Some people just they always, you know. I think the way I look at it is, I I me personally, I, I'm that character. I show I show up, I'm that character. Yeah. So if, if I sneeze, I sneeze like that character. If I mm. if I fall down, I was well, my buddy Jimmy was doing a play back in Manhattan. Jimmy, back in New York City, mm-hmm. a long time ago. And you know, actors support actors. You know, you want to go to their plays, they go to your play. And, and so Jimmy's on stage, and he's um, he's very natural. He's very natural. He didn't really go too far with it. And um, and on the stage next to him was a girl. They were the scene partner in the scene, and there was a thing of milk on the on the table, uh-huh. and the girl knocked it off by mistake. But I'd seen it play a couple of times. Okay, you know that support Jimmy. Yeah. You know, I was like, helping him, and uh, and she knocked it off, and she froze. 
and Jimmy just there was a, uh, a little napkin on the table, like a tablecloth. Yeah. Not what do you call the little, like a small towel. Okay. And uh, he just stayed in character. Okay. Mm. And he goes up. You you always knocking things over, and he starts cleaning the flip and getting the glass. And he gets his lights, ah. delivers his lines, and he put the he put the girl back in the scene. Wow. Oh, wow. And it was so natural. After the after the play, you know, on the way out, you listen to people, you know, for your friend, that's what they say, and. Someone had said, "My God, I I can't believe they break a bottle every night. Isn't that dangerous?" Like they thought it was part of the <laughs> show, <laughs> like it was planned. Like you know, like like Cindy's gonna like the bottle over, you know. Wow. And the girl's like, "I wonder if they went to the audience. Someone got hurt." This guy's written up in the papers. You know, don't they have like breakable glass to do that with? Break away. Why? Isn't that dangerous? And I was like, you know, no, it was an accident. I didn't say anything, but the girl thought it was part of the show wow. because Jimmy was so natural with it. So, oh wow. So. That's where, you know, improv comes in. If you're in character and you get improv, you don't really improv in composing, do you? Well, I mean, that you started to make me think of the fact that... I saw a look in your eye. That's why I'm saying to you. <laughs> well, that's what I was about to get to, is that what happened between Jimmy and, the, and that actress was at least Jimmy was ex- really connecting with her. I mean, he was connecting to the point where... He was in her. He was in her frame. He was in the moment. He was, he was in her. He was in the moment. He knew what he was working with. He knew the dynamic of the situation. Yeah. And you have to have that as a composer with your filmmaker. You need. To, you can't just be like throwing out ideas and just sort of like looking at the wall and, and then what do you think of that, you know? And then you're like, you know, and then they, you know, answer you back and you're like, hmm, interesting. I, I, I could give that a shot, I suppose. No, you, you need to communicate. You need to have a direct, clear connection with the filmmaker. Have a conversation that's that's two brains is bigger than one, you know, something that, that goes somewhere. What you say, suddenly they have an interaction with it that's contextual. It's not just, you don't just put stuff out there. Here's my latest rendition. Uh, okay, push play and what do you think, you know? And then they give you notes. You know, you, after that, you need to discuss it, and you need to be open to what they say. It's not just about you bringing them material. You need to have a communication. Oh, if, if you're talking to composers now, or young composers, I think as as if they're watching the show. Yes. Yeah, that's a great bit of advice because um, I might sound like I have an ego. I don't. I, I mean, when it comes to making a, a better project, I'm I'm open. You know, you've worked with me. I, oh, yeah. I'm open. I listen. And a lot of times, even a bad idea sometimes inspires a good one. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I write. Yes. You know, I write. I've about like twelve scripts, and I, 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 I'm pretty good at writing. I can write okay. I can direct okay, and I can I can act pretty well. Um, but even when I write, I'll give like there's between ten and twenty people I trust with the script to read it for me. I have like the same little pool, different. You know, very diverse demographics. You know, male, female, ethnic background, age, and all that. It's uh, mm-hmm. you want to get the whole, con- you know, the whole ball of wax. And if I give it to ten people, say, and uh, three people say, well, in the third act, why does Kyle say that? I don't get it. Um, it's a problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, you know, I don't go like, oh, why he says it because don't you see it? No, <laughs> right. Well, if three people out of ten read it and they don't get it, then it's a pro- if two people read it, yeah. if it's one person, if it's Steve, and you know, and, and nine people get it, and, and I'm like, oh, Steve, what are you doing? He goes, well, I was, you know, arguing with my girlfriend. I was texting back and forth. I said, well, did you really pay attention, Steve? Go back and read the scene. Mm-hmm. And I slap him around a little bit, you know what I mean? I put him back in order, you know, but he wants to be a leprechaun. And I'm like, and I'm like, and he goes back, goes, oh, dude, I, I was, you know, you know, they get off my college years in Columbia. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and he reads, okay. But if it's, but let's say if Evan, you're reading it and you're like, oh, that third, that third, you know, one of three people, and you say, oh, I have an idea. Maybe we could put a an umbrella over the guy's head because. He maybe he thinks it's raining out, and I'm like, Evan, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I go home, I'm like, my God, he's so high right now, <laughs> right? But I'm thinking, oh man, you know what? Maybe I haven't had a point. Maybe, maybe it's not the umbrella that I want to use, but maybe the guy should be inside, or you know, maybe the guy should be inside because maybe there's some kind of phobia that you feel. He's afraid of rain. And I feel, oh God. 
So maybe I have a guy duck into a telephone booth. Just something, I mean, I'm making, I'm just throwing things out, but your idea of the umbrella living in Arizona in the summertime when it doesn't rain, but maybe it, I get to uh, exploit the guy's paranoia or uh, some kind of insecurity he has in that scene. And it's so different, but even that bad idea inspires something really brilliant. And I think what... Um, Sometimes directors, and I've worked with a lot of them, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Like you go in there and you say, I'm going to try something. They're like, oh, I didn't think about that. I'm like, you, you, you wrote this thing. You didn't see that in the character? Like you, They go, I was kind of relying on you to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but wow, yeah. okay. And then sometimes they get something and they, like the last guy, I went really on the limb on something. And I was like, oh God, he's not going to buy this. So I did this really funny moment. Well, I think I told Evan about it, you guys, about uh, <laughs> where I do a little homage to um, Jaws. Mm. And I'm, it's the three pirates watching this Errol Flynn, you know, kind of Clark Gable swashbuckling movie. And we're like fish out of water. We're, we're kind of through a, a vortex into modern day. And we're like watching this thing like it's real. And one guy says, uh, one pirate says uh, about, oh, it's, it's a shame. The second guy says, oh, it's at least we give him our ship. And then I do the Captain Quinn guy, and I'm like, oh, it's not how it happened. Thirteen tiger sharks and a giant squid. <laughs> and I start doing this like, funny story. And uh, and then when the, our new captain walks in, I say to him, oh, you know, I said, oh, did you find the map? And I just threw, but I made this whole big little paragraph put in there. And so I'm like, I'm about to run this to the director. I'm like, oh, he's not going to want this. Yeah. This is real off the wall. I'm going off the wall now. So before I do the take, Rick, Rick Spall looks at me and goes, you know what? When you say the line, "Captains, you find the ship," do it totally like different, like Cockney or English, like break yeah. your accent totally. He said that. It was his suggestion. Oh, nice. So I'm like, you know, you know, hundred pirates sailed the Matador. We took two cannonballs port side, and then they arrive, thirteen squids, and a giant shark. <laughs> Hello, Captain. You the map? <laughs> but it, it's, it's better, you know. It's you know, and, and it's it's so funny. One of the crew members, I kind of blew the take almost, <laughs> but you know, I. It's a longer thing, but you'll get the point of it. But he yeah. came in with that, with, yeah. with that I with that idea. And I'm like, so he was on board, but he was silent about it all day. Ah, uh, okay. He like a week he didn't say anything to me. Yeah. Just he went, okay, is it? Oh, let's move on. Yeah. I'm like, did he like it? I don't know. I guess. Yeah. But these are the moments. I mean, you gotta yeah. be having these connections. Right, and the same thing when a composer is with a uh, a director. I mean, the director has a vision, an idea. I I have an idea of, of what I want for the score. So, I'm I'm gonna kind of delegate it to the composer. Sometimes, sometimes you know, you know, it's one of those things. It sounds cliche. When I hear it, I'll know, or when I see it, I'll know. I think it's gonna be one of those things where we might do two or three different attempts at something, and then you might say, "Hey, how about this?" Right. And then you might say, "Hey, how about this?" And then we might not like any of them, mm-hmm. and then we might derive at something from it. So I think. You gotta be open. Yeah, right, right. you both gotta be open. Everybody's gotta be open. Everybody's gotta be open. Mm. I recently uh, got on board on a film uh, that's that's doing super well now that it's done and it's out there. Um, and um, when I first watched it, um, and it was these filmmakers really their first time they ever made a movie. Um, and when I first watched it, it was like forty two minutes of very boring just sort of like the world unfolding until finally we got to like something happened in the movie itself you mean yes okay <laughs> and then uh, and so you know I didn't you know I didn't want to say that too critically to them. overstep your boundary but I wanted to make sure that I brought all my experience to their team which is what you really should do you know bring your experience bring it bring it and be part of the team so, you know, I did broach the subjects and I said, I said, you know, what if, what if, I had this idea and, and let me know if you're not, you know, if you're open to this idea or whatnot, just putting it out there. What if we put what happens at 42 minutes in the movie right at the beginning? Right. I love that. If it works. Right at the beginning. Get of the your movie, attention. Now we know something's happened and then we go, let's go back six days and now let's build it up to how the hell did it ever get to that? Yeah. They thought it was brilliant. They recut the whole film. <laughs> I'm not an editor. Yeah, but I'm just a composer. I gotta be honest. You, you, 
you helped me edit the film, Night of the Templar. And it was funny, like, I, um, I had done something, and I had a guy that I took the movie away from. And uh, Evan's watching the film for the first, he watched it a couple of times, and we're on the phone. And I'm still on the fence about Evan at this point, you know? I mean, how can you not be? <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, he goes, too bad you didn't shoot something, a scene where you did this. And I, I said, I, it was, I said, why do you say that? I was playing devil's advocate, you know? Like, almost like, you're, you're wrong, but why are you saying that? <laughs> and he goes, and I said, how about if I shot something like that? And I had shot all these scenes. Yeah. And the last guy, remember, there was like three moments yeah. that I actually shot. Like, I mean, he almost like saw the, it's like, it's, it's almost like he saw the footage. Right. right. It was not in the movie. And, and, and like, you know, it's like on the table, like that blue vase, that blue cup there, and your black watch, and the sports coat. I remember if, we were having this conversation on the phone. I think you were in New York. Yep. And and I was I was going to go on stage to do a play, and I almost missed my, my call. <laughs> but he called me, and it's, I said, yeah, I said, but you're, you're a, you're, it was a time Time difference. zone difference. Yeah. Don't call me between like I think seven. It was like six o'clock. Well, yeah. It so like, it was nine your time. Well, no, it was like it was like five your time. Yeah, like yeah. Five of eight my that's time. That's right. That's right. Don't call me between seven thirty and ten. And I do. And yeah, he does. <laughs> so I did it my time for the third time. <laughs> it's not about you. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but he he mentioned. I said, really? I said, I, I shot that. I remember that. I, I remember shot that you, scene. I shot that. And I also have the other scene you mentioned. And it was like he went like three for three. And I showed him this. Remember that? Yes, and I, said, I do. And yeah. And we brought it back in, and it, it was about story. It just felt like it needed that. Right, right. And what had happened, I think uh, your previous editor had cut that out. Yeah. I didn't know that. Right. You, you didn't see, thought, how could you, you know? know? It would be great if right here you had this, if right here you had this, and at, here you did this. Yeah. And it was, like, it was just very bizarre. It was almost like you, I don't know how you knew it. Hmm. But so as far as I know, you're not an editor, you're a composer. I look at you more as a storyteller. Hmm. Which is a the best composer? Again, me, since I started writing the the written word, not that I read anybody's scripts anyway. I just you know, <laughs> that's why I don't, that's why I don't do TV. It's timed out usually. Oh, you know, more so back in the day. Mm -hmm. I, I did a soap opera too oh, okay. really quickly, I and can I, imagine I qu soon was asked to uh, you know change my ways, so I ended up leaving. But back in the day, it was really timed out, like 23 minutes into the commercials. Now it's like you watch a lot of these Netflix shows, and they're between 43 minutes and 47. Yeah. One episode could be 50 minutes. Oh, yeah. One could be 42. I Cobra Kai on YouTube, and one episode was like 52 minutes, and the next episode was like 23 minutes. I'm like, this is an episode? 23 Oh, wow. Minutes. Okay, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know what I'm saying? So now they're a little bit more loose. So I think, you know... If there's anyone out there that has a TV show, <laughs> I will shave. I will be on time. <laughs> I won't change the dialogue. Um, but but there's more liberty now. And before, it was very structured. I mean, it was sort of period. It was, you know, they have three cameras on you and, you know, you're doing it and, like, you have to be exact. And thank you uh. very much, Steve. Now you smile at the camera and you hold. And it was right, really timed oh, out. Wow. wow. And it was like, you know, one or two shots, and, and it was like, oh, it was too structured. It was like, I don't, that's just what I, you know, I, I can make a living from this, but I'd rather be broke and be happy. Well, you know, it's like, you know, I could, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, but you got, you know, a composer or everybody, director too, uh, to talk with the composer. Don't be afraid to bring some voice your ideas. Don't be afraid yeah. to voice your ideas. Bring them to the table. Just Put be careful, there. though. There's a lot of people. Like, you know how I am. I, I, it's a group thing for me. I want to be there. I want to have five guys in a room and, you know, where we did the last one, yeah. and, and talk. But a lot of... Um, it, how you say it's important. Yeah, a lot of directors, you know, if they're writer-directors, sometimes, you know, they think they're the judge, jury, and executioner. And if you change their dialogue... I did one film, I'm not going to say anybody's name, but I was there, mm -hmm. and the guy hired me. The writer was a producer. And he wasn't directing it, but he was on set every day. And the joke is in Hollywood, uh, when you're doing a film, don't have a writer on set because you don't want to have him on set because you're going to change things. Especially bigger actors, they're going to they're going to destroy your script. They're going to break it down and change everything. A big actor, he's just going to change it and have conversations before they even go in there. I'm more on the spot, you know. But um, and the joke is, 
you invite the writer on the day they blow the car up. Because <laughs> it takes all day. And there's no dialogue. <laughs> it's like, bomb! <laughs> and so he's not going to be there analyzing it like, oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Wait a minute. So this one guy produced, he, was one of the, he put his money in to a movie I did. And uh, he was there every day. Like, he was the first one there and the last one to leave. And he sat encroaching on a director. Like, like... Next to him. Like, like, I'm the director and you're like... Like, like, like this, like, covering over him. And the director was like, kind of like... Kind of like, you know... And he'd be like, mumbling out loud. Like, he's not, he's not used to being on sets. He's a, he's a writer. A writer's a recluse, usually. Right, right. <laughs> and so he used to be by yourself. So if you... Right. If you do it, if you laugh or burp or no one hears it, because you're by yourself in some... You know, some... Back metaphorical room. symbolic cabin you're, you're secluded writing so now you have in population and he's like what are you saying and he's the guy's mouthing the words and I'm I'm pretty good on screen on set you know I'm, I'm pretty focused but the guy was there like going like like mouthing the words and I can I can see him in my side vision thank God Christian Bale wasn't there <laughs> um, uh, uh, but and, and I was and I said to the director, I said, you know, I'm going to change some of this. He goes, I hope you do. It's it's a good story. The, the bones are there. But some of it, I was funnier at times. I mean, look, the guys, the, the writers were about 100 pages. And it was maybe five pages, 5% of it that I want to make better. But, you know, you, you know, you set the whole table here, Evan. You do all this work. That's a tough thing. If I come over and get a, a face cloth and I clean the stain off the table, what am I doing, 1%? I'm making it better. But you did all the work. But the guy didn't want you to clean that. Even if it was better, he had such an ego, this guy. And I was like, so what the producer did was, I mean, the director did was, the producers, the other ones, they sent him to the bank to do something <laughs> when I was on, just to get rid of him. And the director was on a turn off set for me. I said, no, it's his movie. I mean, just have him go somewhere. So they had to go to some sandwiches. Yeah, they did. They gave him little errands to say, "You want to take a break now?" And we act like we're taking a break. <laughs> he would literally leave, and the group's like, "He's gone," but he was torturing the whole set. Yeah, you know, he's like going to the lighting guy, and you know, and, and the and the sound guy. How's the sound sound? And and and, and it was like, dude, stay in your lane. Right. Like you wrote it. Go home now. <laughs> if if you're there and you needed, if there's a, a a story point, and let's say the main actor says, "Oh, I I just realized something." I didn't have a coffee cup in the third scene. And he goes, okay, I have a fix. And he fixes it. It's one thing. But he was just kind of... They say supervise until you trust, and then once you trust... Then walk they, away. Yeah. And then I've had some writers... Um, the movie Mel I did. Yeah. The movie Mel I did. Uh, we did a table read. And I improv did a table I improv did a table read, which you don't do. <laughs> but he called me. And he goes, oh, I, I have my kid uh, this weekend you know we were separated he goes but Monday I'm free come by the apartment and we rewrote my character and he goes I have no ego he goes I'm getting credit for it yeah so it depends on who you're working with yeah it's, right? exactly that's right. my point so yeah. that's a writer and directors some directors uh, they have big egos yes and and I had a spot on one movie early in my career and, and see you can sort of broach these subjects later I've been doing this I've done 200 projects over the last 25 years you can broach these subjects with the right finesse now and know to kind of either cut back or go ahead with it but I didn't have that kind of finesse in the beginning of my career there was a, a filmmaker I worked with who said uh, but there's no big boom on my name on the credits you know and, uh, and I said uh, oh uh, you, you want me to put that there he goes, well, and I'll get another composer. And he hangs up. I had already finished the entire score. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, and I regrouped myself. I called him back a few minutes later. I said, oh, no, no, I got that. No worries. No worries. Very sorry. And I could see that apparently, you know, I had overstepped some bounds and stepped on his ego or whatnot. Yeah. And uh, you have to be careful with those ones. Yeah. It's, you, and, know. you know, and you, you can work a... It's people are people. That's the thing. I mean, what's the best advice? People are people. And, you know, hold your ground, hold your integrity, but don't... What's that? The expression, cut off your nose to spite your face? Oh, yeah, I've never heard that one. You guys? No. You've heard, I've heard that before, yeah, actually. Yeah. Don't cut yeah. off your nose to spite your face. Okay. You never heard that before? No. Maybe it's a... That's a really good one. That's a, I think it's been around for, like, maybe, like, 2,000 years. Oh, all right. <laughs> I think Judas was with Peter. Uh -huh. Peter's with the knife... 
Mm-hmm. Hey, what are you doing? The oldest profession. <laughs> yeah, is cutting off your nose. Cutting off your nose. That was it. Then it became Just prostitution. But, you know, <laughs> initially, it was cutting your nose off. It's cutting your face. And then once Judas said it, they were like, oh, he's got a point. Well, yeah. Everybody in the room put the knife down. They're like, what else can we do? Oh, Never prostitution. Yeah. So let's eat. No, yeah, don't eat yet. Too soon. So, yeah. So, uh, uh-huh. Well, uh, hey, uh, Holly does have a question for us. She says, going back to when we were talking about music being a character, or just everything being kind of a character in a movie or an element, a useful element, um, what do some of us, uh, any, any one of us, uh, have any examples of, of films that had a score which was an incredible element or character in its own right? Oh, man. I mean, I think, you know, like some of the ones we mentioned, It Follows, it was huge. Did you see It Follows? Well, there's only one that I can think of okay. that I've heard, and I didn't hear it before, but I wasn't, I was, you know, I was too young. I don't know if I was, what year it came out. Um, allegedly, when John Carpenter did his first Halloween movie, this is the, the Hollywood story, he did Halloween, the first one, with no score, and it was mm. rating like zero. Mm. And then he put that little piano score in there. Yeah. And to it, see how it would test, maybe. It's it's not a is it a character or it, maybe it's an element. I don't know what I know what Holly means. Yes. But um, but that's that piano thing he did. You can look it up. You can probably YouTube it the story. But that little piano thing he did, which is subtle, it changed the movie. So that is an example of where I know that it changed the course of history. You know, mm-hmm. doing that. That mm-hmm. Halloween is, you know, I don't know how many they, they made. Um, as a character itself, as, as an element, I can vouch for that. Um, but you guys are the composers. Yeah, yeah, no, I would say uh, that filmmaker uh, Coppola, Scorsese, and Kubrick, they, they all are like real masters of understanding from probably even before the script screenwriting stage. How is the music either culturally or emotionally or psychologically going to play in this. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. And even, okay, I just thought of something else. And even not just composing, even like needle drops. Yes. How many times, there was a movie I was talking about with my buddy, you know, Ben Stoll is a comedic actor, yeah. usually. Uh, he's, he did a really good, good job in a movie called Permanent, Permanent Midnight, ah. where he plays a drug addict. Hmm. So he's a good actor. People think, oh, he's you know, Ben Stiller, he's funny, but he's he, he has chops. But a movie he did, um, oh, what was that movie he did? Uh, the Extreme Life of Walter Mitty, or right? Smitty. Oh yeah, man. I haven't seen Walter it. Walter Mitty. Yeah. What's it? The Extraordinary, Extraordinary Life. Extraordinary Life of Walter Smitty. Or Mitty, or yeah. I, oh god, I'm, I'm blowing it. <laughs> anyway, yeah. there's a moment, and you're gonna watch the movie. Okay. Everyone should watch the movie. Yeah. There's a moment. There's two moments in the movie. I told that. Um. But there's a moment in the movie, I'm going to give you three examples right now, that I don't give the movie away. But he has a decision to make, and he's always the guy, I think his character is always that guy who kind of like, oh, I'll let Kyle do it. Yeah, oh, kind of in the background. I, I could kind of like, oh, oh, oh Steve's talking now. Mm-hmm. And an opportunity arises. It's with the helicopter scene. You'll know when, when you see the movie. Okay. Uh, look up Ben Stiller. And, so he's like not assertive or something. Yeah, but there's a helicopter scene. And the way the score, it gives you goosebumps in the movie. It's like that moment you're like, oh my God, like what a perfect needle drop. <laughs> and the way they it crescendos and this and that, it's a helicopter thing. It's in the third act, I think. It's a third act. And that'll be, a, that'll be an example. And then even that monster with um, Charlize Theron. Mm. Oh, I didn't see it. Okay. okay. There's a moment with, with her with her and Christina Ritchie. She's got the Academy Award. And they have that song, uh, Just a Small Town Boy Living in South Detroit. Uh, on oh, and man. on and on and on. Yeah. That song. Um, I don't know if it's the first act, end of the first act, but where they meet up. Um, and they end up, you know, I don't want to give that away too much, but, <laughs> a, but that song plays. When that song comes on, her and Christina Ritchie kind of get together. All right. And it's one of those moments. It's not a score, but it's a, it's a needle drop. Yeah. But that really, wow, yeah. that makes a scene. Mm-hmm. If you do like this and you watch a scene like this, with it, it's not the same. But that, and there's been movies, 
you know, I feel like in Templar, I know it's a simple film, it's not a studio film, but there's moments like where the oh, score yes. just, you know, you know, there's moments in there where the score really yeah. propels the we, story. We used, you know, uh, we, 70 songs in, in really, really key moments. Yeah, in the, in the, in the score. Moments. Yeah, and, right. and even score, but yeah. I would say, you know, but right. Yeah. Wait, you know, and, um, Unmistakably. So, as far as a character, character, yeah. um, it's a, it's definitely an enhancer or a catalyst. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just two examples. Mm-hmm. So see Monsters Ball, not Monster, just Monster. Monster Ball is a different movie. And then see the the Ben Stiller movie, and you see two moments. And there's a lot of moments. I'm thinking of Scorsese films. Yes. I think I said three. Films are like, yeah, I mean, and then Tarantino <laughs> films. The way you just do it. Yeah, and then they're needle drop guys. Yes. A lot of them. But you, you know, that's how you have to think as a composer. You really should get to the point where you can go. You know what? Maybe we, we should put you know uh, this classic '70s track right here. You know, this is this John Travolta moment. You know, like you're you're high. If you're you know really responsible for the music to do the yeah. storytelling for this film, you know, if you can have that power to just get out of the box of even just writing with an orchestra, that really gives you a lot more to bring to the table. But you don't want to do it just to do it. I remember, I don't mm. know what movie did it. I, 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 it. Okay, some movie made a turning point where there was a killing or something like that, or something really dramatic happened, and they started playing like. Oh, uh, operatic it moment. was John Woo. It was, uh, they did the Somewhere Over the Rainbow in slow motion with Nicolas Cage in that one fight scene up in the loft when he goes to visit the drug dealer. Is that the scene oh, you're thinking of? No, no. That was No, but that's a great moment. Face-off, face-off. Yeah. Right. But they went... But it's those kinds of moments, let's right. say. Right. But there's been, there's been movies where you've, you've had like this really like realization moment or this really like killing moment, like a really brutal moment and they start, start playing like operatic music mm-hmm. yeah. and it's such a conflict yeah and I don't know who did it the first and second fun. time oh maybe I don't know when it happened but I, I, can't, I can't put my finger on one now Everyone else, I gave all these examples I, I'm failing for an example right now yeah. but it was just really against the grain like totally 180 degree mm-hmm. opposite uh, thing where this music is so different from what's happening it, it's incredible and then I've seen some composers and filmmakers try to do this, right. and it's just kind of like, dude, you just, like, you're just copycatting, copycatting something else, and uh, yeah, maybe it's a new generation, and they haven't seen that, and you saw a movie from the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, and now someone's 13, and they haven't seen a movie, yeah. but you still, you go to the well once in a while, go to the well, but you should do it when you feel it. Go to the well, mm, yeah. You know. My teacher, Lalo Schifrin, did huge tons of movie scores and one of them of course being Mission Impossible and the theme that we all know but uh, he did the score to the to the Steve McQueen movie Bullet you know and everyone comes up to him I mean it's just like endless ever since that movie everyone comes up and oh my god I love the incredibly exciting music you made during the car chase scene up and down the streets in San Francisco you know god was that exciting he says uh, I didn't score there's no music right <laughs> so to say that yeah well he what he did was he built up tons of tension as they're like trying to you know get ready to chase each other they see each other and they pull up to the stop sign and then is he going to take off does he notice me uh, tailing him and you know all of a sudden and then he's building up all this tension and then all of a sudden <laughs> And that's all he said. He wanted to play the sounds of the different engines between the cuts, like right. And uh, mm. you know that's a great example. And and also wasn't Viggo Mortensen in some movie where he had this like naked fight scene? In oh, the that bathroom. was um, Eastern was, Promises. Eastern Promises. Eastern Promises. There was no ah. music in that scene. It was like twelve minutes long, and it was really intense. You know. So sometimes the most intense. It's funny you said that because no um, music. I know I have a funny beard now, but. He has like sharp features. Yes. And I was in to do the scene with. Uh, it could be a double. I was in to do the scene with when I fight Norman. You know, when I, when I hit him uh, when he's kind of raping the girl thing. I was in to do that naked. <laughs> was, but I left to go change. Yeah. And then, she, you know, and I, I was going to run into the scene and do it just. Oh, like you got to run out of the shower because you heard some screaming. Or, or whatever I was doing. Gotcha. I don't give the movie away. But right, I was going to come out just naked. Yes. And do it. And then I was gonna, um, I was just gonna do it. And then, at like five people said, "Oh yeah, like Viggo Mortensen from uh, Eastern Promises." So there you go. You look like him a little. 
Oh, oh so you're copying Viggo Mortensen. And I'm like, uh, and then the other person said, I'm like. And you're like, I haven't seen that movie yet. I'm yeah, like, I didn't okay. see that movie yet. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can see that movie. You right, know? right. right. And so, uh, so if I pants on, basically, <laughs> if I clothes on. Yeah, but that's a great instance of like, you know, you know, it's just the importance of how you got to be creative and have ideas. Yeah, I didn't things. see it. I just thought it was, I did it as a story point. Th- that later on you realize what I was doing, that I was actually the guy changing. You know what the story's about. Right. I don't give the story away. So yes. now, now it would be like, oh, cool movie. Later on it makes sense. Oh, that he would be changing. Yes. Mm. And then I thought I could come up with my shirt off, but no. Then oh, he's showing his shirt. You know, you know. But I was like, you know, what? I'll just, I'll just get the shot done, <laughs> yeah. like in one take and move on. But uh, yeah, it worked. Yeah, it worked the way it went. It worked yeah. perfect the way it went. But, but yeah, creative creative uses of music. Sometimes no music, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That moment had no music in your movie. No. And it was very intense and violent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, qu- a question for you, Paul. Uh, how did you uh, end up choosing Evan for the film? What What stood out to you? He was trying to get away from that earlier. <laughs> no, oh, no, I, I, no, it was, okay. no, no, no. It's a good question. <laughs> You know, we all make mistakes in life, Steve. <laughs> and uh, some are bigger than others. <laughs> can you just un- untie this thing on my leg so I can get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> it's chain- I'm, I'm, I'm chained in right now. Yeah. We're, we're I'm in show. California. Send help. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I went through buckets and buckets of... Uh, good question. We never got to that. And that's one of those things, why do you choose a, a composer to do your film? This is... It's always full circle with us. You know, we, we start with things. We have and, to have uh, a point, yes. Right. <laughs> well, the point of that was how do I, you know, the submission thing. about the That, that point was about the um, academia. Yes. Do I go by the resume? And I was saying how I actually go through it. Yeah. Um, gobs of submissions. Right. And so I narrowed it down to six or seven <laughs> composers from like, I don't even know how many buckets of... And and he was one of them, uh, and I had a conversation with all seven. Hmm. I had a conversation with all seven. Just a, a quick one, the first one around, the you know, and um, a couple of them, like three of them, just turned my stomach. I don't know why. It just you know you're talking to someone, you know, you know if you date a girl, you kind of know. When you see her, you think about things, and girls are the same way as guys. Girls know if they're going to sleep with you within ten minutes, Ugh, you know, ten they, seconds. Yeah, they, they know if, if it's, I'm not saying like being rude, but they know. I shouldn't say it like that. If there's an attraction, you know. Um, and you're on the phone with somebody, and I'm. People say I always give people like I'm talking a lot today, but I usually give people enough rope to hang themselves. Like I'll look, I'll play dumb. You know how I do it. I just I sit back and I like I act like I know nothing. Tease it out of them. Yeah, and there's been like, I mean, one of the little side thing. One of the actors came in to read for my movie, and I was the lead of the movie with the Muldoon whacked, and this guy didn't recognize me because I didn't see who I was, and I I had the long 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 hair when I was doing the medieval part of it, and I had a bigger beard than this. I turned it down for the movie, and they got to know who I was. And I told him not to say anything. And the guy had a movie I had done on his resume. And I, he wasn't in the movie. And he was, and I said, oh, wow, who was in that movie? And he said, he said my name. Oh. And I was like, why is he doing this? Like, I guess he had known, he thought I was a casting agent. He was trying to get to the next level to meet me. Right, right. He's actually, he was already in front of me. Anything, yeah. Right, and he's talking about the movie and he wasn't even on the set. And I was like, wow, this guy is such a bullshitter. He's really good. But but I I just I just and another girl told me she had done a lead in the movie, for the the Amy role, and I knew the girl did a lead in that movie on her resume, so sometimes sometimes you can get caught with some of this research on your resume. That's to go back in the resume thing, um, but there was like two or three guys that I talked to that were really like just too much. Not in a, I don't know how to say it. They just I didn't feel like talking to them anymore. And I'm a conversationalist, and I just didn't. I didn't. I wanted to hang the phone up. Mm. You know, maybe instead of five minutes, it was a two or three minute conversation. Mm. And then it was four guys I kind of liked. One guy priced himself out right away. 
he told me about his resume and how great he was and how much he should get and mm. he just and I I emphasized that I was an independent filmmaker I'm not a studio and he told me that my movie would suck if he didn't if he wasn't a part of it he didn't see it <laughs> and as a first time filmmaker I didn't know what I was doing and you know he knew I was as an actor he goes but probably you're, you know as an actor you're going to want to put yourself in this and do and I'm like that's a, he was a jack off, wow. you know. So he was gone. <laughs> so it was on the three, and I really like three guys. One guy was in. Um, and this is out of like we're talking a lot of submissions. Yeah. To get down to that seven was a big deal. So all those seven guys, you being one of them, was very qualified. Two or three I didn't want to talk to. One was priced himself out. One was in in uh, Europe. Okay. And I I I can't do the long distance thing. I wasn't going to go on a, you know, we can Skype. Yeah. And so it was down to him and another guy. And I told him another guy's name. And the guy went missing. So I don't know what Evan did to <laughs> so, <laughs> no, him. So I talked to Evan about his, his hand DVD. Ah. And how I felt about it. And what I liked about it and didn't like about it. And we kind of talked about that for maybe 10 minutes about his music. And you had nothing you sent me too. Was another DVD you sent me? Another CD mm -hmm. or something? Maybe with some video clips? And I said, I don't like that one as much. <laughs> I know what you're going for, but I felt like you were more creative on the other one. Mm -hmm. You know, he agreed with me. He goes, yeah, that one I was limited by the director. He wanted this and he wanted, the, he wanted to hit the... It's probably the guy that had that big boom on that. Yeah, he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to connect the dots. And we talked about that. I go, would you have done differently on that? And I heard it, and he had sent me a scene with that, and I know what I would have done differently, mm -hmm. yeah. creatively. And I said, what would you have done differently if you had that leeway? And he told me exactly what I would have done. No kidding. And I was like, oh. And they, they became the, uh, the Corsican brothers. <laughs> that, that, that Chichen Chong movie where one feels the other one's pain. <laughs> yes. Or happiness. And, uh, and I met with him, and... Uh, he was a very good musician, you know, which is important. Well, not really, but it is. And he was in a position where he would share his wealth of knowledge or his... He had, he had a, a network of editors you would... I mean, uh, composers you were dealing with. And he, he didn't have an ego. He had no ego. He had the talent. He had, he had understanding. He was willing to work with me. So it was all pluses. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a checklist of maybe two things or 20 things. It's like dating someone. Because you be, you, it's a relationship. Because in, mm -hmm. I was at his house a lot. We became friends. You know, and um, I ate dinner at his table. We went to events together after that. And, you know, I do movies and, and sometimes I meet actors. I meet a lot of actors. And some I just, you're done. Or I've done a lot of plays. I've done 37 plays up to date. And it's like chess pieces in life. Like... You meet people. I meet a lot of people. I travel a lot. I'm in different countries. I'm in different towns and cities. It's like being a, a rock rock and roller. And every once in a while, you collect a piece, a, ch a chess piece of life. You know, and, and uh, it's like friendships or relationships. And I had a, a camaraderie with Evan. You know, professionally and then socially. And uh, the social one came out of a respect of, of his professionalism. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, like, I'm not going to be friends with somebody I don't respect. Right. Like if someone, you know, cheats on their, the, on their wife and is mean to their kids, I've been involved with a lot of actors, like big names that want to hang out with me. You know, and I, I don't like them as people. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. other buddy's like, dude, that's like blah, blah, blah. He wants to have dinner with you? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but he's kind of a douchebag. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like he's, you know, that I have some guys like that I'm still buddies with. I met him like, you know, like, like Muldoon, Patrick Muldoon. We, we played brothers together, like foster brothers, the one common like to play with my sister. And we're still buddies, Pat and I, you know, like 18 years later. Wow. Oh, Norman yeah. and I are still friends. It's, you know, certain people you like David Carradine and I became friends. He just died, you know. Yeah. But you know, we were shooting, and then you know. But uh, some people you become friends with, and you you, you like anything else. You go to the gym, right? 
there's a thousand people working out, and you and Bob become buddies. Right. And you go to, hey, Bob, you start talking about different things, and you go to movies together. Then you, you know you're going to Thailand together. Yeah. <laughs> and you start double dating. <laughs> the, same, the same girl. Same girl. <laughs> yeah, twice. But, you know, different show, I sorry. Think, uh, in, a, in an interesting way, you know. Yeah. Stay, stay, stay in your box, stay in your lane. <laughs> Control yourself. Go ahead. In an interesting way, uh, you and I are, uh, to most people, looking out and not in and not having the connection that we have because we do, you know, we, we, we do have a connection on many, many areas. Uh, we're very unlikely two people. No, to, yeah. To, 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 to have that. You know? No, and it would, But I think that also shows. That, you that's know, what I'm saying. You're a lot more than what people would perceive. Oh yeah, no, they look at me like, well, forget the beard, but I look at they look at me and they have a whole different. I'm always misread, like a yeah. thousand times. Yeah, like, my whole life I'm I'm misread. Yeah. you know, even with casting people, uh, I'll deliver something and they'll be like, you know, we saw like 45 guys for that role. I I didn't think you were going to do that. They expect to go like the certain er, right? And they're like, wow. I always get that. That's interesting. They don't really hire me ever, but yeah. no, I'm just kidding. But I think part of that, you know, shows but that it, it, it's a, it's a kind of a, I'm against type. Yeah, like the brute guy in the Marvel comics. Yeah. You know, brute like you're this big brute guy, and he's kind of like you know sensitive. Right, right. And sad. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but I wouldn't. Yeah, if you saw the two of us. Um, but we're talented. The talent. Well, you're more the talented. Talent is than there. <laughs> but, no, you are. Uh, you're more. You're more talented. I'm just. Um, oh come on. I'm just a better showman. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's about uh, seems yeah. like seems going like Columbia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Columbia, Columbia, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you have to you have to find the talent because usually the best talents uh, don't come with that huge ego. I mean, okay, there's a lot of talented people, but you don't, can't get far with that huge eggshell mm. protecting ego. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know? it's it's an insecurity a lot of times the ego, yes. and I've worked with a lot True. of people. I mean, look, I mean. I got a funny shirt on, you know, and this is Evan's jacket, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, the sleeves are too short on me, but I don't really care. Evan did, he goes, you know, you take a shower this week? I'm like, what, what week is it? <laughs> I'm a pirate, R. <laughs> Be matey, I don't shower until the show's over. Um, but it's, I'm attracted to talent as far as my friends, or, or, um, not obedience, that's the wrong word. <laughs> it's a totally wrong word. Disobedience? No, no. Um, loyalty, uh -huh. in, a, in a sense. Reliability, loyalty. You know, I mean, mm. again, I've I've had people, a lot of girls, you've seen someone I dated were really pretty, but I just didn't feel like I connected with them. Right. Um, mm. And some of the girls I've dated, it was more about what's inside of them. It, this, I, I saw something else inside of him that wasn't was this different and Evan's different Evan's different in a lot of ways uh, borderline insane at times <laughs> like I saw that's me no but uh, Evan's different in a way um, he he, has a di he walks a different to a different drum you definitely do you know most people look at you and be like what the hell's he thinking <laughs> and I'm like I know what he's thinking you know, right? He's thinking the right way, and he's thinking, thinking it, not trying to be different. And the thing is, when you say think outside the box, you don't really try to be outside the box. You just are. Mm. You know, maybe so. Yeah, you have a little screwy, in other words, but in a good way. I mean, you don't. You're not like you know. You're not a cookie cutter mm. uh, person, and it's okay if you are people, as long as you can experiment. But by nature. Well, that goes a little bit back to the very beginning of this whole show today. You mentioned something about kind of you're alluding to the importance of bringing in different disciplines into what you do and how that sort of cross-pollination can, can get you connecting dots that others may not have. And that creates new connections and you can bring new things to the table by connecting these things from these different disciplines, you know? That's what I'm talking about. Like, what he just said, I have no idea what he said. But it sounded so good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it sound good? Yeah. And, and the audience like this. They're like, cross-pollinating. No, I got it. <laughs> I got it. Well, hold on. Yeah, we're pollinating. We're pollinating. Um, no, no, right. I think the main thing in life, it's like, you should be open. You should have your morals and your ethics and your values. 
and not do what you don't want to, you know, don't be forced to do something, you know. Mm. Don't become what other people want you to become. Because right. then you'll just be them. Right, or, or, or their vision of what you should be. Sure. Mm. Uh, but don't, despite, you know, cut your nose despite your face, don't be different. Just to be different, to be awkward. Mm. Like, don't be one of those actors that, like, you know, I only drink blah, blah kind of water, and I want the green M&M's. Like, never be <laughs> one of those douchebags. Right. You know what I'm talking exactly. about? Don't. Oh, definitely. Anybody knows a guy that only wants to go, that He's I know like, of? Oh, maybe I should go with purple then. Uh. He goes, oh, <laughs> Simpson's calling me out on live on a podcast. But, you know, don't be that yes. guy that, you know, I need to have blue curtains. You know what, dude? It's about the work. You know, don't exactly. never become that guy. Like, don't make it easy for someone not to hire you. Don't give them an excuse. But, you know, you'll be... Even actors that are on top for a while, everyone's replaceable. Like Hitchcock said, well, where's, where's Cattle? Val, where's Val Kilner today? I, I would never mention a name. Brilliant actor. <laughs> he, he said that. I did not say that, Val. I did not say that. You're a brilliant actor, and I think what you do with Jim Morrison was phenomenal. Yes. Phenomenal. No, Val's great. I just <laughs> meant that, uh, you know, he's got a lot of these vices no, that yeah. are causing problems for him to be hired, yeah. Right, right. There's actors like that, but a brilliant actor. So I'm not going to even agree with Evan <laughs> on that. But I mean, uh, but yeah, but there's actors and there's musicians and there's people that just... And that's that's an attitude thing. And then there's some people who are artiste, mm-hmm. who they want to be different in the scene, just to be different. And yeah. I'm going to yell now, or I'm going to be really big, just to be different. And like, yo, dude, you know it doesn't work for the character. Mm-hmm. You know, just... Not saying you're lame. Like Carrot Top, he's, you know, he has to go home at the end of the day. Yeah. He never goes home. He never goes home. He never leaves that stage, and I love him. <laughs> Wasn't he ripped a couple of years ago? Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's, uh, yeah. You, could, you could be he's Carrot still, Top. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that in, 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 a, in a sexy way. I mean, Carrot Top, if I was a chick, I'd be all over him. Oh, Jesus. He, he, I mean, I remember Carrot Top was like, like, kind of like, you know, it's Carrot Top. And then one time, I, was in, I saw him in Vegas, I think. Oh, sure. And he was like, smack, you know, and... and I'm like, my God, I can do my I do this, I'm doing abs again. <laughs> he was like jacked yeah. up. Yeah. Well, I probably spent 20 hours at the gym. I, mean, I don't know what he was doing. He doesn't sleep, you know. Yeah, he, he seemed like that type of guy. Yeah. I'm like, I said, how? <laughs> <laughs> Eight ball, side pocket. <laughs> but uh, but he was like jacked up. I mean, ripped up Carrot Top. I yeah. mean, I don't know. How do we get the topic of Carrot Top? How are we on Carrot Top? And right now he's saying like, Zang. This is what I love about the podcast. I can just go anywhere. Yeah, but I think, uh, don't don't be difficult. Yes. I mean, and the thing about being, um, I get this thing, and I know I'm being very mellow today, Don't about be being, um, just to be different. what's mm-hmm. the word, uh, ex- like, not extravagant, uh, uh, quirky, no, uh, um, eclectic, no, you're close, uh, uh, obtuse, no, uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> write these down, okay. yeah, uh. <laughs> like they're saying, really posi- they're yeah. saying positive, you said all negative things, oh, okay. <laughs> eccentric, 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 yeah, eccentric, I'll get that once, once in a while. But I don't think I'm eccentric. I think I'm, you know, I think I'm just, I don't think I am at all. But, you know, I've had vehicles in the back seats full of, like, uh, uh, three months' worth of clothing. I have, like, a little ice, but I'll live out of my car once in a while, you know. And, mm. I, you know, I've done that out in L.A. And I've, I'll have i go somewhere for a day and I'll stay five weeks. You know, I've done that. And you wake <laughs> up in the morning, we've we done editing, you'll go downstairs and I'm on your, on your floor sleeping, like, <sighs> save time. I don't want to commute tomorrow. But I, but I do some odd things in the past. I've done some really odd things in my personal life. And uh, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to do this to be eccentric. I just thought at that right. time that was what was going through my head. Mm. Well, it just was what you needed in order to be at peak performance. Right. If you, you know, sometimes you, know, you don't want to deal with something, so you go live in your car for a couple of weeks so you can get into a character. I even asked, I, even asked um, I, I shot the first week downtown L.A., they they built a built a boat in the studio, and I had a place to stay in Studio City uh, while we were shooting. But the commute was horrendous in the morning. You know, trying to get downtown to get a, a spot. So I got a really really crappy hotel room. Uh, like right there. Like within within um, I took the bus okay. every morning. It was a good eighteen minute bus ride. You know, I was across the street from King Taco. <laughs> and and I was you know I must go to a fist fight the first day I was there. <laughs> this guy was all messed up. And across That's the my st- taco. and across the street there was the lady was always selling clothes in the street on the fence. Like I was in the barrio, you know what I mean. But I was thinking, 
I don't want to go back to um, like an hour the, and a half. the comfortable studio city. So when I bought my clothes, and I even this went on to the when we up in Mendocino, I had a pair of yellow sneakers and a pair of like baby blue shorts, and like I bought like a, off the lady like a pink or red shirt, like nothing matched. Mm-hmm. And the reason why, and I went to Mendocino, and the wardrobe lady gave me something. I went to, I went to the local thrift store, Salvation Army bought something, and I have suits in my closet. But this is that sound really weird. A pirate, you know, when a pirate goes out there, you know, they're not worried about if their hair is greasy, and they're not worried about like, like I'm a pirate, and we go to a, a Spanish ship, we take over. I take your ruffled shirt, and then maybe a French shirt. I take your your hat, and then maybe another. But we take over. I take your shoes, and pirates are mix, mix matched. So yeah. I was I was like that outside of shooting, <laughs> and mm. like they all call me homeless up in Mendocino. <laughs> and, and Fort Bragg is a homeless population. Okay. And the other crew member, uh, the other uh, actors, a couple of them, Louis and uh, Theo, they were saying you look homeless, dude. <laughs> like I looked homeless for a couple of weeks up in Mendocino. And I'd go outside the shops and just be looking at the shops and they would come out and be shooing me away. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. It was kind of funny. I was like, you know, the homeless people like, yo, you want to have a banana? And I'd be hanging out with them like, you know, and uh... <laughs> well, I think that goes towards something that I've been um, into, which is, in a good way, try to figure out the way to conduct your, this, to do this in a good way, but, uh, you know, be shameless. Own yourself. Right. Be what you are. Everybody's got faults. Nobody's God. Nobody's no, no, perfect. Oh, my God. Hopefully. <laughs> we, everybody's got their different problems. It's me, but how would you get better and how would you learn? Yeah. If, you know, if, you, if you're already great, I mean, if you're already perfect, like, you know, like God, say, or Jesus, whatever, you or know, Christian be religious. Or Christian Bale. <laughs> <laughs> if you could only be Christian Bale. Yes. Um, then, you know, where do you go from there? Get off my set. Yeah. <laughs> He's right. I mean, I, my buddy, it's okay, it's my true. buddy, and he said it to me. He goes, Samson, this would be you on set. Right? And I wouldn't do that. I just would hit the guy. There was no conversation. No, but I, I'm like, and, and a lot of my buddies were laughing about it, but I'm like, he's got a point. And I don't know what really happened, but, you know, when you're in that zone, and he goes to, in, into like a twilight zone, that guy. When you're in a zone like that, yeah. and, and you, I don't know what the guy was doing, how bad it was. Yeah. But if the guy's going back and forth in your oh. in your in your vision and carelessly, yeah. you know, I don't I don't know what the guy was doing. I'm not saying this particular moment, but let's forget his incident. Right. Before it's somebody like walking by, texting with the light on it, it's like going to a movie theater. Yeah. You go to movie theaters and people are texting next to you. Right. It's like, you know, there's a screen and you are focused. Yeah. But you lose that. Five percent or one percent of your focus, yeah. because that girl down there or that guy down there, or, or they're arguing or yeah. they're talking on the phone or the cell phone, yeah. you, you're totally transfixed on that screen in that moment, and you're gonna lose. I don't care if it's one percent or twenty percent. You lose some, and and something of watching that movie is taken away from you because it's it's your head your head's wrapped around that. At some level, so if you're acting, mm-hmm. and someone's over there like texting and the lights on, and you're you know in front of the camera, it's inevitable. Yeah. You are, you are going to lose. And I don't care if it's one percent, or ten percent, or fifty percent. And a guy like that, Christian Bale, he's so committed to his project, he's so committed to it yeah. that you know you have this guy there working for you, delivering the goods. Why would you? Why would you let someone? Distract them that much. I'll be messing with something. And I'm not saying again, I don't know what happened on that day. But, you know, he cares about... I see that... I mean, he got a little too far with it. If I was a guy who was talking to him, I wouldn't have t- tolerated it. On the, other, on the other, other end of it, like, yeah. I wouldn't let anybody talk to me like that. Right. But then I, I wouldn't do that to the other guy. I wouldn't distract him. But it was kind of awkward... It's such a tough place, you know, and it shouldn't have uh, been shared the way it was. Oh, no, that, that's I, that totally I like. inappropriate. But it's out of context. It's totally out of context. Exactly. And I, I hate that out of context stuff, like what yeah. happened to like Mel Gibson the years yeah, back. Yeah, you know. Like it's a recording out of context. I mean, yeah. look, I, I've done it. Everyone's going to disagree with you if you show everyone, everyone on earth, yeah. what you do. 
I you're mean, gonna have plenty of people disagree. Yeah, you're gonna have more a lot of negative feedback. And what happened with like Mel Gibson, look, every guy, every girl, whether you're you're straight, gay, you know, bisexual, and you're in a relationship, at some point you're gonna have that argument with somebody. And you're gonna scream and say things that you yourself want to take back ten minutes later, and then you're kissing the girl or you're kissing the guy, whatever you're doing, and you're making love and you it's it's like a break uh, make up sex. Right. But you know, you know, everyone's had that. You know, I mean, my everyone's had and that. And he but. had that. He apologized to the guy, and the guy was cool. You're right. So, right. And, and the thing is, you have that thing where, like, say the Mel Gibson guy, other people have, have rants or raves, and, you know, it's not really fair to do that, to, to take, take, someone's, out of context. take someone's moment, a nadir in that mo- a, a low, low end of their, of their life, and just pull out and say, oh, and this represents them. Yeah. As a whole, and I, I hate that. That's why I'm, you know, I'm not really on social media. I hate when people do that. Oh, it's stuff, a huge thing now. And they'll pull out some, they'll extract some little excerpt from what Kyle said, or what Steve said, what Evan said. What, you know, you know, and they're like, oh, this is their essence. Then you know, I can't believe he's a bigot. Right. And he didn't say anything. What? Right. All he said is like, the guy who helped me paint is blah blah blah. Right. And you're like, you know, go back to the moment. They were, they were joking around. I think I. This hurts a lot of the comedians nowadays where they yeah. go back and the guy had a moment and like, oh, he, he made this kind of joke and you're like, he, no, the, you know, he said this 10 years ago. This guy said this 10 years ago. I'm like, oh my God, he said that. But you go back, he was in the middle of a comedy routine and he was making fun of everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're taking that little thing he said, that little excerpt. Sharing it around. And you share it around and people are so, I, I don't get that. I don't think the guy, would, you know, whoever that was, you know, would have, would have had they don't see they don't have the courage necessarily to have that just one on one conversation about what they just heard. So to share it around with everyone else, it's like, oh, it's a, especially like, on social media where you can a little bit cowardly. How hide behind your computer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and see if anyone else will do the dirty work for you. You know. Yeah. Well, when what the person that had that recording, hmm. I wouldn't have a problem with the the actor or the crew member. Or the director who kind of couldn't defuse it, didn't defuse it, or how he tried to defuse it. My problem would be with the guy that actually recorded it <laughs> and, and made it public. Right. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. Mm, like, yes. what, like, you know, did he sell it? Did he make money selling it? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like these are people that they want to get head in life, but they they don't really have the personal strength. It, you know, so instead they do these cop out versions of trying to tear you down and trying to see if that will raise us up. Let me ask you a question: That guy that recorded that and sent it out, would you hire him? Right. No. No. I wouldn't trust him. No. no. Because let's say I, I, I'm having a bad day and I tell him a, a secret of how I sh- used to shoot heroin, you know, and we're having a tender moment, and then he goes, "Oh, that's so sad." Then he goes, "That's so sad, Bob." I, and then he goes, "Oh, by the way, this is Bob who's on heroin and he's." You know, has fourteen oh, kids and, and like, it, yeah. It's like you know, it's almost like, wow, you know, you, you know, I don't want anybody around me I can't trust. Yeah. It goes hand in hand with what you mentioned before, how you and Evan just have that camaraderie. Yeah, that's how you chose him. He's 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 easy, Evan. I mean, he's difficult <laughs> as far as he doesn't compromise. Right. Which mm-hmm. I'm the same way. Is, that's a, a but you pick quality. your moments. You yeah. you know, you, you become difficult when you want you don't want to compromise the, the, the peace. I wanna explain that a little that's very interesting for people to understand because you're like, he doesn't compromise and you don't compromise. Then how the hell do you ever come to agreement? I'll tell you how. It's you discuss what is the right thing to do here and you keep discussing it yes. until you agree. And now you're neither one's a compromising. Right. You're just coming to the best decision together. Yeah. When I say you don't compromise, I don't mean like, you know, like I have an idea and you go, no, this is mine. I'm not compromising. I but mean. It's meat in the middle. It's not even, it's, it's, it's a, it's playing, it's a playing catch. It's back, it's a conversation. It's a conversation. You have a conversation and, um, and again, sometimes you deal with egos. E- egos destroy art. You know, like egos destroy it because people get so in their in their mind what's right and wrong, and yeah. and sometimes they're right. Egos are bad for you yourself. Like Orson That's Welles, he's he's just a genius. Yeah. I mean, what happened with him was he had the studios. I guess back in the day, he did like um, Citizen Kane, and it was genius. And someone does Citizen Kane, 
He's just green like the rest of his stuff. I mean, his whole life is paved. It should be. Yes. But even Orson Welles, I mean, a level that any actor, uh, director, filmmaker, whatever you want to call it, yeah. just human being gets to creatively, wow, that's like the top percent. Yeah. And even with him, and I don't want to be negative against producers because they're the ones that hire me, but they went, or the studio. Yeah, I know what they did, yeah. Yeah, they took his movie. They burned some footage. And and they changed the score on him, <laughs> so he had a score, and they take it. Oh, that's nah, it's not I commercial. Yeah. And they Ooh. took his score, is it is threw it out. He had some else do it. And you know how they did that? They sent him to Mexico to go shoot that other film. You know, yeah. So that they could start to get into the vaults and start to play around, mm. yeah, and fix it up. Mm. Yeah. And 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 they ruined the the value of the movie. They made it more. And the thing is, you would think after someone can prove themselves so many times. I mean, how many times do you need to prove yourself? Yeah. He did Citizen Kane, oh, another one, and they still were... Well, you know, it wasn't really recognized until I think the 70s as as, as an important piece of work. Well, right. Yeah. Right. A, and that was not just for the thing, but also for the camera angles and the... He, uh, he, the floor. And he pioneered. So, oh. Right, right. He, he wanted a, a below shot, so he just got like a, an axe and took the floor around and put the camera lower. Yeah. I mean, he was just outside the box, but... You have that. So, as a young composer, someone out there, just realize it's sometimes you have to just listen to people. Sometimes you you got to listen. You know, yeah. just try to try to understand someone's mindset, or someone's mm-hmm. ideal picture. But at the same time, keep your integrity. Yes. You know, I don't know. It's mm-hmm. a tough one. It's a tough one. Integrity, and especially when you're starting off, you don't want to refuse work. Mm. You know, it's so tough to get work to get started. Right. It's so difficult. Like actors, you know, don't run into a wall for free just to get footage. Yeah. Just to get tape. So yeah. it's one of those catch-22 things. Do I do this even though I don't believe in it? Uh, what do you think? I think, uh, you know, go get an apprenticeship. I think that's one of the great ways to spend the first three to five years of your career. Instead of what you just said, it's like trying to see if you can piece it all together. It's going to take you longer, you know. You, I mean, if you work with an established person already, you'll be able to at least for a year or two. For at least for a year or two, just you know. To, you know three to five. And it sounds yeah. crazy. It's like almost like if you're gonna, if I was going to buy a restaurant, I would, and it sounds silly, I would work in a restaurant for a month as a dishwasher. And I would work as a month as a as a room service guy. I'd work a month as a pots and pans washer. I work a month as a manager or whatever. Or every level, mm-hmm. I'd get a job bartending for yes. a month. And this way, when you own the restaurant, you know every asset. If that makes sense, right, right. And I think with me as an actor or an entertainer, I've been on stage so many times. And when I want to go into film, I did extra work. You know, and I ask stupid questions to the yeah. DP. You know, I'm like, you know, hey, and they, and they usually like you. Why'd they do that, John? <laughs> yeah, like, Bob, uh, what size lens is that? Yes. Well, that would be a, a you know, this, uh, is that for like a wide shot? Oh, then you, and it's just being around it. And I think yes. if you're with a crew, like somebody is with you, yeah. it's kind of like not, not like you're making mistakes on someone else's time. You don't make the mistakes because you can see it. You know, mm. being a, a part of something you see what works and what doesn't work and what could work for you and you're kind of getting getting gaining experience just being around something sometimes you know if you want to you know be a trapeze artist just traveling with a circus yeah for a year yes you know how they how the the professionals how they chalk up their hands yeah. and one how the, the timing I, one of the ways that I started out was uh, I was a gopher at a recording studio that started out just making coffee for the engineers. Just bringing them coffee. Eventually, I worked up to wrapping cables. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. wrap cables. <laughs> Eventually, I, ra- I, I worked my way up to fetching microphones, you know, which worked up to laying out the cables and connecting the microphones, coming back to the music. Eventually, I was normalizing consoles, you know. I don't know if you know what that is. You know, Kyle probably knows. <laughs> and uh, which is, you, you get on, you actually get to touch the board and you get to turn all the pots back to zero, all the faders all back to zero. They call it normalizing the board. And, you know, eventually assistant engineering, you know, which is making sure that you're helping run out there and fix some microphones and get things uh, for the engineer uh, the way you want. So, I mean, that started with 
making coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And having humility. And that's, that's how it is. Especially, yeah. I mean, back in the day, that's how recording studios were. I think it, that's, they still pretty much are like that, where it's your in the lowest rung of the ladder. But you're you're always learning, and I think that's what well, you just mentioned too, Paul. That's I think that's the key to especially this industry itself, or just music in general. Even if you are a, you consider yourself a master and expert, you're always approaching every single situation yeah. as a learner. Yeah, it's, what it's, am I going to learn? Yes, yeah. you know, mm. and I think that's. You Not know, only, I mean, just I mean, just think about the fact that the industry is always changing. No, on exactly. You. you you can't. Not just that, but technology. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. So I mean, gosh, you're you're going to be always learning. You know, life is short, so you know you better stay sharp. You know, if you want to be doing something when you're sixty, seventy, eighty. Yes, exactly. New trends come in; they they, they come and go, and it's especially our industry. We see that all the time. You know, new new technologies come in. New. Uh, Anything new practices, new new ways of recording, new ways of sampling, and it's just you you have to go with the tide. You always have to approach it with this open mind. And yeah. so. well, I think that was a great show. I, I don't know what Steve wants. Steve talk. had a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I mean we, he's we making notes. Be, uh, the whole time. Notes. We would be. <laughs> Let me see his notes. Really good we wouldn't be that, here. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be <laughs> see his notes. <laughs> I'm so disorganized. Uh, buy organic chicken. <laughs> pasture raised cage free pasteurized paint <laughs> actors is crossed out it says homogenized milk <laughs> I can see the correlation Steve you wrote pollinate 19 times on this yeah <laughs> pollinate alright everybody thanks for tuning in today that was uh, our special guest Paul Sampson and uh, yes sir a really wonderful little wonderful person great collaborator great actor great filmmaker and I'm, I'm very um Privilege to be working with Paul. Right. I have to give you basis. give you money back now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Paul. All right, Thanks thank you, here, guys. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. High five. High five. Backwards. Oh, I like that. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>